as I mentioned, good morning. And um, my name is Amanda Hodges. I'm the Doctor of Plant Medicine Director. For those of you who don't know me, but I certainly do believe that I know many of you, if not most of you. And it's just really exciting to be here with you for the second uh, annual Doctor of Plant Medicine uh, Conference, uh, specifically that we're having now virtually because of the pandemic, but uh, we look forward to having in-person meetings you know, again soon when we are able to do so. But I would like to begin by recognizing uh, Dr. Elaine Turner, our Dean for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And Dr. Turner, would you like to just provide a few comments of welcome to everyone? Sure, thank you, Amanda, and good morning, everybody. It's great to see so many students and faculty and alumni and supporters uh, joining us this morning. One of the things we have learned in the last year is that this is a pretty easy way to get together and bring people in um, that we might not see as frequently. So I think one of the things we might keep post-pandemic is, is some Zoom catch-up time. We, it won't take place of face-to-face -face and, and being physically together, but being able to catch up this way with uh, some of our friends and alumni and supporters who we don't see as frequently is a real treat. So thank you all for, for joining today um, for your investment and support of the program, no matter how you're affiliated. Um, this remains one of the unique programs in the country to do what it does and to, to prepare plant doctors. Um, our mission in the college is to prepare students to um, be able to address the world's critical challenges related to agricultural natural resources, community systems, food systems, and plant medicine sits right at the intersection of so many of those challenges. And so it's exciting to see this program continue to thrive, um, have this conference today, bringing so many people together. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing what's new and what's going on and some of, some of the updates. So. Um, thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us this morning. And thank you, Amanda, for all your efforts in directing the program and working with these very talented students. Thank you, Dr. Turner. We really appreciate your time. And thank you for joining us here today. Uh, Dr. Brendamil is also with us and he's our Associate uh, Dean for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, Dr. Brenda Meal, would you like to uh, welcome everyone as well? Absolutely, and I would uh, just uh, echo everything that uh, Dr. Turner um, has already indicated. Uh, this is a, an extremely uh, unique program, um, one of only two in, in the U.S., of course, and maybe those are the only two worldwide as, as far as I know, and uh, so it's, uh, it's an exciting program and continues to be a, an exciting program. And uh, I'm just uh, thankful that I can be a really tiny little uh, part of this. Um, and uh, as Dean Turner indicated, uh, looking forward to uh, hearing all of the exciting things that, uh, that are happening, uh, not only from the students, uh, but from our uh, alumni and supporters who have uh, gathered here uh, this morning as well. So uh, again, um, welcome uh, to everyone and uh, looking forward to uh, the symposium. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenda Mule. I also noticed that uh, Madeline Mellinger, who has been a longtime supporter of the Doctor of Plant Medicine program, is here from Glades Crop Care. Madeline, would you be willing to just say a few comments about uh, the Dr. Platt Medicine Program. Morning, everyone. I too am glad to be and, and special faculty who are uh, so supportive of the students. Uh, it's a wonderful program, and we look forward to even more strength as we go forward. Uh, we have a new vice president now who's supportive of the program, and Dr. Turner. Along with your support, I'm sure the program will improve even more. Thank you, Dr. Hodges. Thank you so much, uh, Madeline. And I also noticed that uh, Ben Belusky from our External uh, Advisory Stakeholder Committee is, is here with us. Ben, would you be willing to say a few comments as well? Good morning, Amanda, and good morning to uh, the students and alumni and faculty part of this uh, 
really fabulous program. It, it is, uh, I believe it's uh, said, it is the intersection, uh, the core intersection of uh, what our respective industries within Florida agriculture need. Uh, it is a, a program that, that offers tremendous uh, career, job and career opportunities to graduating students. So con uh, congratulations to all. And uh, uh, Amanda, thank you for all that, that you do. Thank you so much, Ben. And I noticed that our alumni co-chairs are present, uh, Tim Durham and uh, Clay Peterson. And Tim has really been instrumental in, in planning the program. Uh, Clay, perhaps we can begin with you. Would you be willing to just say a few comments? Sorry, delay on my mute button. No, welcome everybody. Uh, glad to see uh, such a turnout this morning. Uh, I know we all wish we could be here in person, but uh, I'm glad that everybody's here and I think we're all looking forward to, to listen uh, and learning. Yeah, and I wanna also just say uh, thank Tim as well for all the dedication and hard work he's put into to getting this going. So um, with that, I'll pass it over to Tim. Thanks, Clay. Really appreciate it. Just on behalf of all the alums, again, I just I want to thank you all for your attendance today, albeit virtually. You know, I know we'd like to be meeting face to face. That's always the best route in many respects. But there there is something to be said for virtual delivery of, of programming. It allows a lot of people who would otherwise be able unable to attend in person to be able to participate. So I'm looking forward to the, the festivities today. And um, with that, I'll pass it back to Amanda. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. And I'd like to recognize one additional very important administrator from the University of Florida, Dr. Blair Siegfried. Would you like to provide a few comments before we begin? Thanks, Amanda. Um, We've heard a lot of good things about the program. I think it's important to recognize how much effort and, and time Amanda puts into administering this program. Um, the quality of the students and, and graduates uh, really has been um, impressive, at least over the last six years since I've been here. Um, the, the interdisciplinary nature of the program makes it what it is and how valuable it is to the industry. and. Uh, I look forward to participating in today's activities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blair. And we really do uh, appreciate the support of all of the departments affiliated with the Doctor of Plant Medicine program, but particularly the entomology and nematology department, which currently uh, hosts the program and serves as kind of the home location for the program. And so with that, I'm just going to briefly review our program for today. And uh, we're really excited that our first speaker is our keynote address from Mike Arts with the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association. And he's really going to introduce us to some of the challenges that we're seeing in the industry currently. And then later, uh, Tim Durham and Nicole Casuso will be leading an excellent panel discussion where we will be focusing on the challenges to food security and food safety in our backyard. Mike Arts will be present, as well as uh, Dr. Hugh Smith and uh, Unit James Mack from the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Customs and Border Protection, uh, Dr. Bob or Bob Hockmuth, as well as uh, Dr. Trevor Smith. So we're really excited about the program that we have uh, planned today. And with that, we're going to begin with our first speaker, and that is. Uh, Dr. Mike Arts from the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association. He's gonna tell us all about the industry. Um, Dr. Arts, welcome. Anyways, thanks Amanda, and thanks everyone for participating in our little Zoom event here this morning. And has been echoed before, while it stinks that we have to get together in this kind of, kind of manner, it's still really good just getting to at least have a chance to see everyone once again. And well, this, there, are, there are some positives. This is the first time I've ever been able to do a keynote wearing shorts and tennis shoes. So there are positives in, in anything that we do with these, these days, but it looks like we have a, a super-sized crowd participating today. So that's absolutely wonderful. 
Um, first of all, before we get started, I just want to say that I hope you and yours have all been doing well throughout this entire virus mess that we've all been dealing with throughout the, the, this past year. Uh, keep doing what you, what you have to in order to stay healthy and safe. We're going to get there. When Amanda asked me to do this little conversation and converse with you about the overall status and of the, the overall status of the Florida agricultural industry and then potential future opportunities in this sector, well, that kind of set me back a bit. Overviewing the state of the industry is not something I typically deal with. You could say it's outside my usual wheelhouse, outside my area of comfort, if you will. So a good bit of homework had to be done on all this so we could have our little conversation today. But like you, I've always, for the most part, been involved with the scientific and technical aspects of the agricultural industry. And along those lines, so that you get to know me a little bit better before we get started, you should know up front right away that, that I'm a damn Yankee. Of course, Yankees come down to Florida from up north, they visit and they go back. Us damn Yankees, we come down and we end up staying. Well, I spent my first 25 years located in the lower peninsula of Michigan, halfway up the peninsula, right on the Lake Michigan shoreline. So that's why you see the Spartan statue behind me. But nevertheless, this is what my Februaries typically look like where I came from. That picture on the left is a picture of our neighbor's house and a, a one day, one night event that occurred and well, it just kind of stinks when you have to dig for the car in order to dig out the car. And the picture on the right you see there, that's a picture for my driveway looking west. And you can just barely see the top of the stop sign up there. And what are the stop signs? Eight feet tall kind of thing. So that gives you an idea of the, the types of snow that we were dealing with on, on an annual basis. So yes, I took the snowmobile to school a lot of days. But I spent my time in Michigan working on apples and pears cherries, peaches, plums, Christmas trees, and asparagus kind of things. Well, when my back got all sore and my disdain for constantly shoveling snow, it took me from this type of a February situation to this type of a February situation. But right away after arriving, I realized that I was way outside my typical comfort zone of things. I did my graduate work on ascomycete fungi attacking apples and cherries. And my first project after coming to Florida involved spiny amaranth in, in lettuce crops, spider mites and strawberries, and aphids attacking citrus. Day and night differences from the old way of what I was used to doing kind of thing. So you're probably wondering why am I telling you all this? Well, bear with me here a little bit. We're just kind of setting the stage a little bit. And that all revolves around the theme of getting comfortable when you're outside your typical wheelhouse of comfort sort of thing. I mentioned day and night differences. Well, think about the day and night differences we've all experienced this past year. It has changed so many things, including the situation involving all things agriculture. Now, you should know up front that, and, and it's going to vary depending on the commodity and very dependent on time of year kind of thing, but approximately 60 to as much as 70 percent of the fruit and vegetable commodities that Florida produces go towards the food service sector, not the retail sector. So 60 to 70% of our product typically goes to food service. So what happened to Florida agriculture when the United States shut down like it did? Well, obviously restaurants were one of the first things to close when this whole thing started. So right away, 60 to 70% of the Florida market went away because that was the primary sector that we were dealing with. Schools, of course, shut down immediately. The school year overlays almost exactly with the Florida harvest schedule. So all the products that Florida had been providing to the school system throughout the United States all of a sudden had no market and nowhere to go. Uh, things such as the cruise line industry, you'll see them here in this picture stacked up like cordwood. Well, Florida produce trucks beat a path down the roads to Port Canaveral, to Lauderdale, to Miami, uh, servicing the thousands and thousands of people that were on these cruise ships on a daily basis kind of thing. And of course, we all had to do with the, with the theme park situation. Think of the tens of thousands of people that, attend, that visited theme parks throughout Florida and the hotels that associated with those theme parks 
and it was Florida that was providing 60 to 70% of the product that was going to all of these various aspects. So when these entire markets literally dried up and went away, they literally did it in a matter of days. So what happened to the Florida, to Florida ag agriculture when the United States shut down like it did? Well, this is the sort of situation we ended up dealing with. Because of the fact that the everyone that the, the restaurant shut down, the, the theme park shut down, school shut down, everything shut down in a matter of days. What we're, we're talking about here is these things happen right in the, the, the peak of our spring harvest season. We couldn't just hit the pause button and hold on until things maybe turned on, turned around a little bit. So we ended up destroying millions and millions of pounds of product, unfortunately, as a part of the way this whole thing happens. We're talking about highly perishable products here, of course. These products have a lifespan of probably at most about 14 days. So when there was no guaranteed market, well, this is the destruction sort of situation we, we were dealing with. And just to give you an example of the, the length to which this destruction occurred, uh, we had one farm in South Florida when this occurred, destroy two million pounds worth of green beans and five million pounds worth of cabbage. Think of that, think about that. One farm destroyed two million pounds of beans and five million pounds of cabbage. I've not done the calculations with respect to how much actual product had to be destroyed back during March, April, and May, but I'd really hate to see what that number actually was in fact. Uh, the fact is, because of the situation and the way it evolved, uh, well, the, the food supply, the food supply chain did not pivot very well at all. And how much did it not pivot very well? Well, in, when in doing some of the checks that we've found out, approximately 40% of the growers who supplied their product to the food, food service industry ended up destroying some of their crop. Almost a third of those growers destroyed more than half of their food service dedicated crops. And a small percentage actually had to destroy all of their food service destined crops. So there again, you can kind of get an idea for the vastness of the destruction that was occurring. And simultaneously, as we're disking down all this product, as we're culling all this stuff, well, if you went to the store, this was often the situation you, you encountered. There was a lot in the way of empty shelves that were present because of all the hoarding that was going on, because of the fact that, remember, we were supplying primarily to food service. We did try to foster and broker as many deals with retail as we could, but keep in mind that retail also has a lot in the way of, of paperwork requirements. You have to jump through a lot of hoops in order to be able to sell to a lot of these retail outlets. They get legal involved. All this sort of thing takes a vast amount of time up front. The, 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 the supply chain couldn't just pivot on itself and automatically start sending stuff to retail because of all these requirements that are in place. It's, it's like trying to turn an aircraft carrier on a dime sort of thing. It just doesn't happen. And to add a little bit of salt to the wound as to what all this was going on, at the same time we're destroying all of this Florida product. Well, imported veg was, was simultaneously experiencing a double digit growth. And I've yet to be able to understand the logic and how Florida's been essentially being required to destroy product, while at the same time, the imports of those very same commodities are growing in double digit manners. So it, it just didn't, it, none of it computes. I still don't understand how this exactly happened, but that nevertheless was the reality of the situation. So as I mentioned, you know, a lot in the way of restaurant closures occurred and all the theme parks shut down and that sort of thing. So the industry, it, it was, a, it was a, a terrible, awful period at that time, but the industry had to figure out how to potentially adapt and how to potentially overcome some of this situation. And the industry did pivot as best it could. Uh, one way in which it tried to pivot is that it tried to supply excess product uh, to the food bank system. But what do you think happened when all this Florida produce started going to the uh, to the food bank system that's that in the way it was designed? Well, of course, they couldn't handle it. The system became overwhelmed almost immediately because remember, we're talking about millions of pounds of product that are going to the, to the 
to the food bank situation and they just in that don't have the logistics to manage it. They just don't have the storage capacity, any of that kind of thing. And to just give you an idea of the vastness of which some of the stuff was sent to the food banks, uh, we had one grower uh, send nine 53 foot semi, -tro semi truck trailer loads worth of strawberries to the Tampa food bank system. Think about that, nine semi truck loads. Think of what that was actually worth on the open market that he sent to the food banks. Because, but you know, he had already grown the crop, he'd already harvested the crop, he'd already packed it, he'd already cooled it, it was ready to go. But at the last minute, the contract he had in place fell through, so he didn't have anything he could do with that product. And being it only had a 14-day life span, all he could do was potentially send that to the food banks and then maybe get a tax write-off at the end of the year, kind of thing. So those are the types of examples that we're dealing with with respect to food banks. So the industry is pivoting as best it could, but of course it still didn't take up all the slack. And there are a lot of losses still occurring. So some other pivoting was attempted. A lot of growers, especially down in South Florida, opened up situations where consumers could come directly to their farms and purchase boxes of produce. The grower would just assemble these boxes with various commodities that were ready at the time. They'd make this known over social media as to what is available and when kind of thing. And then, yeah, consumers would just line up and show up and get the, their vehicles filled up and away they would go. Well, this situation was going to work fairly decently in an area such as Dade County or something like that. But if you're in, for instance, Bell Glade or Immokalee or places like that, you're just not going to get enough of the way of consumer um, traffic present in order to get such a thing to successfully work, unfortunately. So a lot of losses were just constantly occurring. So we still had to do something in the way to try to figure out how do we sort of rectify the, the loss situation that was occurring and how can we potentially come up with methods of which we might be able to provide assistance to the Florida grower community. So we worked with other organizations from across the country and with the USDA and came up with a number of uh, assistance programs that, that we could develop for Florida growers. And I'll just, I'm just listing a couple of those here. Uh, the first one we did was, it was the CARES program. There was also an agricultural component that was a part of the Paycheck Protection Program that was available. And then we had the Coronavirus Food, uh, food Assistance Program, a one and a two, that were specifically designed for specialty commodities. So we were successful in, in getting some of these programs through, but very this is very much outside of the typical comfort zone that we and me in particular were, were, typical, were accustomed to working in. I literally did not do a single thing on my job description for four months as we were trying to put these assistance programs together, just trying to do whatever we could in order to get uh, the, these systems in place and trying to get these growers some resources and assistance so that it could simply be able to hold on just to get them to the next year. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail on these relief programs, but I just want to give you an idea of one of them on the CFAP one, just so you get a baseline understanding of how some of this stuff typically might work. Well, producers could be eligible for payments under one, two, or three different categories, or all three, just depended on the grower. But first of all, the first category involved uh, what type of percentage losses they were occurring from, from a price standpoint. And that would involve, because they had a baseline price that was established in January of last year, that was considered the normal routine regular price. And then they also had to compare that then to what the price was in April after the whole system shut down. And because of the fact that we had to just a glut in the product then and the, with the supply and demand situation, the supply was everywhere and there was zero demand. So prices literally went through the floor in most commodities. A second category where they might be able to obtain assistance had to do with spoiled product where they loaded it and shipped it, where, but it didn't reach its destination. There was some of that occurred, but not much. And then the third category had to do with the fact where any, any situation surfaced where the, the product was unable to be harvested whatsoever. So looking at those three categories, remember, we're, we're dealing with USDA here. USDA is custom, they're comfortable dealing with field corn and soybeans, 
uh, wheat, cotton, those kind of commodities where they just throw a number at an acreage kind of thing and then they're, they're, they feel situated. They don't understand the complexities that surround, that surround specialty crop production. But nevertheless, these are the, the payments that USDA assigned to each of these different categories. Uh, and I'll just do an example here real quick. We'll just, we'll just pick blueberries there in the third line. If, if, if you were, blueberry growers were able to show that they had a 5% price decline between January and April, so what they had to do is they'd look back on their 2019 volume that they marketed and all this information had to be made available to the farm service agency for validation and auditing that kind of thing. So they'd make their, that information available to FSA and they, they calculated a 20 cent per pound that the grower would be eligible. So if they grew, if the, if the grower had 100,000 pounds of blueberries, let's say, he'd be eligible for $20,000 under that first column there as, as far as assistance. Then if they had some blueberries that spoiled, they'd be eligible for about 93 cents a pound of that. And if they didn't handle uh, harvest any of that blueberry acreage, they'd be eligible for about $1,200 per acre kind of thing to potentially cover that. So how did all these kind of payments kind of work out when, we, when push came to shove? Well, you'll see that especially crop did not fare as, as well as you might have thought it would. This is on a national basis in millions of dollars. You can see the beef cows and the milk, the dairy guys, they made out pretty well, but uh, you'll see especially crop there on the left, they're barely a blip on the graph, unfortunately. And if you expand that to just look at what happened in Florida, it looks a little better, but it still kind of follows the same trend. <laughs> the beef, guy, beef guys made out really well, but there you can see, we, the Florida strawberry sector, sector was able to obtain $20 million overall to help it get to next year. The squash sector in Florida got 12 million. Uh, the, 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 the pepper sector got another 4 million. So there was something, so there was success that occurred. It just not, it, it just not, it was never to the degree it needed to be. Now this, these programs were never put in place to make the grower whole or anything like that. It was just intended to get them to the next step, the next season kind of thing. So you might be wondering, what was, what's the real hang up here? What, why didn't specialty crop do better than it did overall? The reason is the maximum caps that were placed on each grower. If you were a farmer and a single owner of, of, of a farm, the most you could obtain as part of the CFAP one program was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, if you had a, if you've got a two thousand acre operation, you know that two hundred fifty thousand dollars is is not going to do much of anything to sustain you to get to the next season. There again, remember, like I said, USDA doesn't understand that the complexity of especially crops. If you look at, for instance, peppers up there in the top column, uh, we could prove that it takes about fourteen thousand dollars to produce one acre of peppers from, an, from a pre-harvest input standpoint and a fixed cost standpoint. Well, if, you're, if you own, for instance, whatever, 300 acres of peppers, that $250,000 cap is gonna cover about 18 acres of your 300 acres. So this is why we had so much problems in the way of getting Florida growers more money. And that's why there's so much in the way of a, a disproportionate um, number of results that, that came back from the CFAP programs. It, it had a lot to do with the cap situation and the fact that the, the Florida specialty commodities are just worth so much on a per acre basis. So just to give you an idea of where, how Florida came out overall, we were successful in getting about $180 million under CFAP one for Florida growers overall. And then the amount of, of monies that went to specialty crop growers in Florida equated to more than half of that, it was about $101 million. So while, like I said, it's not making everybody whole, it was just intended to try to get folks to the next level kind of thing. So that's kind of a snapshot of where the, 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 of the status of the industry, especially during 2020 and the situation we're in at this moment. But what do you think I'm, it is I'm trying to tell you about all this? about all this uncomfortable, about all this working outside our usual wheel, wheelhouses kind of thing. Well, the proof is there that we all have to be much more flexible. 
You are all highly trained and experienced from a bunch of scientific and technical aspects, and you all have a real passion for science. But I'm suggesting that you may need to get more comfortable expanding your horizons beyond those comfortable aspects. And if there's one point I do get across to you here today, it would be this. Whether you like it or not, whether you ask for it or not, the fact is you all are leaders in the Florida agricultural sector. And your companies and your employees, the employees you work with, will be turning to you for guidance and mentoring. And it will be your responsibility to take on those leadership roles. To do that, you're going to have to be more flexible. And you'll probably have to, probably have to think way beyond what you're, what you're routinely used to thinking about. We may be comfortable thinking about leaf miner counts and humidity with respect to bacterial spot and trap numbers of pepper weevils or whatever. We're gonna to have to go way beyond that sort of thing. Well, this being February, I thought maybe I'd reflect on what happened on the Super Bowl earlier this month. Think about what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had to do in order to get to the winner's circle. And think about what Florida agriculture is going to have to do to take advantage of future opportunities that might be out there. Well, Tampa approached the, the 2020 season with a completely different mindset in how they were gonna approach things. They developed a completely new strategy. They developed an entire new vision for what they were going to do and how they were gonna do it. They identified points of advantage that they could exploit and use to their advantage to get to the next degree. And then they intensively, intensively laser focused on those advantages that they could exploit to get them to the next level. And this is exactly the sort of thing that Florida agriculture is gonna to have to do at this point. So from a strategic standpoint, I'm gonna be suggesting that each of you spend at least some time of your day thinking about strategies. Any good leader is gonna to have to do this and more responsibility is gonna be placed on you to do these sort of aspects and come up with these new types of strategies. Well, the Bucks also went about and created an entire new different culture with the team and the way they were doing things. Uh, they committed to produce a great team. That's exactly what the sort of thing agriculture has to do. Uh, they, they built a culture where the, the entire team was recognized for results. Remember the Bucks brought in all this offensive power that was getting all the headlines and such, but actually it was the defense that carried Tampa on to the wins in the last month of the season. And of course, what we just mentioned, there's going to be a lot in the way of innovation that's going to have to take place. We're really going to be have to be flexible and venture into areas where it typically we might be entering the unknown, I guess you could say. Now, we might have all been comfortable with what the old normal was, but I think this past season has demonstrated the old way of doing things just isn't going to work anymore. The proof was there that the perishable food supply chain is extremely fragile. You just can't turn that aircraft carrier around, around quick enough to get things to work. So from a strategic standpoint and what you're thinking about, we're gonna have to think about what's possible, not what might have worked in the past. Now, a point of, of advantage that we've already got established for us and that we're gonna have to exploit is the fact that everybody who's involved in the food production, transportation and distribution system is now considered essential. There's a newfound respect for anybody who's in the food business these days. And that's a very obvious uh, benefit that we should be exploiting and taking to, the, uh, to advantage as best we possibly can. We talked about the way some companies might have been pivoting with respect to de dealing directly to uh, consumers and that sort of thing. Well, there's going to have to be more of that sort of thing. We had other breweries that are on the West Coast of the state stopped doing their brewing aspects and actually turned around and started making hand sanitizers. Those kind of, of you know, unforeseen, unimagined aspects are going to have to be a part of our, our thought processes going forward, because we're going to have to figure out exactly how we solve the, the problems that exist between produce as, ex, access and produce excess. Well, but us all having the, the scientific and technical background, of course, we're going to have to do much more in, in the way of additional data generation and much more in the way of research. But we might have to be flexible in the way we consider doing that, that type of research. And we might have to do research that's outside of our comfort, typical comfort zone. 
We're going to have to do what we can to exploit the situation we're dealing with respect to the creation of the healthy world that consumers are, are in, interpreting right now. We're going to have to, any research we do that from this point forward is going to have to fully revolve around the power of purpose. It's we no longer can we just do research in silos and that kind of thing. While it might be nice to do this kind of research or interesting to do that kind of research, the research we do is just going to have to have purpose going forward. Absolutely. We have to use that purpose to figure out how we can elevate and create more purposeful research. That's part of that strategizing that I'm going to ask me asking everybody to do on a daily basis kind of thing. And then how can we use that research to enhance and advance the industry ultimately overall? Well, food is being observed now as medicine by consumers. Of course, doctors of plant medicine have known that for a long time, but consumers are just now fully understanding the fact that food is medicine. So there's another situation that we've got that we can exploit. And how do we do that in a more, the most efficient manner to, to, uh, act, to, to emphasize the fact that produce has a role in our personal health and our personal wellness? Commodities such as citrus and greens and berries, their sales were off the charts during 2020. The main reason for that, the perception around the fact that these commodities provide a lot in the way of vitamin C and a lot in the way of, of immunity defenses sort of thing. So that's how we got to use that food as medicine and, and emphasize and get the message across as to how we can use produce to prevent and treat and improve health conditions overall. Now, some of the research, like I said, might be out of the box, might not be within our usual comfort zone. We're going to have to be flexible with this. Just to give you an example of some of those types of research. Uh, there are new grocery carts that are available in some stores now. These dash carts are something completely different from typical carts. These carts have uh, cameras mounted all the way around them. So that anytime you put a product in the, in the cart itself, those cameras will read the barcode and automatically that item will appear on, your, on the screen up there that you can see as well. Now, of course, for produce, this is going to be a little different situation. Produce doesn't typically have barcodes. So what the cart does, it has a scale in the bottom of it. So anything, anytime you put a produce item in the cart, you'll just go to your screen there and bring up whatever, bananas. And as soon as you set the bananas in the cart, the cart will automatically weigh that and the cost will appear on the screen then so you can see it. And then if you take it out, of course, that will be deducted from your, your totals. But here's where we're going to have to, we might have to do some thinking about the types of varieties and such that we're making available for these type of situations. Because, for instance, uh, no longer will sweet corn will have to be figured out. How, you cannot have a long shank with respect to product that's going to be put in, in a cart like this because consumers not going to want to pay for a bunch of extra weight that's a part of the shank sort of thing. So there's a lot that we're going to have to be thinking about with flexibility in the research we do for these type of cart situations that we're going to be looking at. Another aspect to fill another void that had been out there, uh, this, this tangerine on the right side of the screen, that's actually a variety called Juicy Crunch. Well, there was a real void that existed because of the fact that Florida didn't really have much in the way of a tangerine that was that marketable. Well, this tangerine is actually about the size of a navel orange almost. Um, it's got no seeds. It's really, really easy to peel. From a sensory standpoint, it's phenomenal as far as uh, visual, as far as aroma, as far as all the, the taste characteristics, the, uh, the, the, the juice characters, everything about it. And immediately when consumers realize this, these things sold in Publix for $1.25 a piece. Each tangerine sold for a buck and a quarter and they could not keep them on the shelves. They were that popular. Another example of research we might have to do might have to do with shelf life of things. This, these strawberries here, you know, we all went to, went to the fridge, opened it up, and, and well, we might have put the, those strawberries in there two days, and now they're already just a, a bunch of a white fuzz. Well, these berries are a new variety called keepsake, and they are said to be able to withstand as much time as two weeks, two full weeks in the consumer's refrigerator. And then there may be just other novelty things like the white strawberry that we might be thinking about exploiting. While these, anything we can do along the lines of, uh, you know, increasing consumption, increasing purchases, the white strawberry won't have any additional nutritional benefits, but it may help push the way in, the, uh, may help push additional purchases of strawberries just because of its uniqueness kind of thing. 
those are the type of things we just kind of need to be thinking about outside the box. But the one that really has taken the trophy, I guess you could say, has to be celery juice. You know, what is celery made up of? It's about 90 some percent water overall. But there are perceived health benefits from the strawberry juice. And this was just a, a pick I picked down off the, off the web this week. And they're selling packs of seven 32 ounce bottles of celery juice for about a hundred bucks. Can you imagine? So what a, what a success that type of approach took, but they were, the celery guys were very flexible in how they approached a varying type of market. This is the sort of things I think we potentially, we potentially need to be being flexible about and thinking about. Another area we might typically want to do more research on would involve food waste. Uh, this is a very timely topic because there's going to be more in the way of legislation handed down by EPA with respect to landfills. And we may want to get in on, on the front end of this so that we're doing things on a guide, guideline standpoint as opposed to a regulation. But I knew it was a lot, but I didn't know it was this much. Apparently, Food and food packaging items account for almost half of the items that are landfilled in the United States. That is just a phenomenally huge number. And I was thinking it was more like 30%, but some of the resources I saw show that's about 40% of the food that's out there actually goes uneaten. And that equates to about $218 billion every year spent on food that's never eaten. And it's more than just a money situation because there are environmental impacts that go along with all this. Well, right away, more than 20% of the water that was used to grow the crop essentially ends up in the landfill. About 20% of the fertilizer that was used to grow the crop ends up in the landfill. That means 18% of the, of the land area that was used to grow in that crop is basically worthless. So yeah, can you imagine a, a, a grower get un, realizing an, a 19% increase in their fertilizer budget kind of thing? They would love that sort of thing. We have to figure out how we can get these numbers reduced some. And at the same time, we've got all these problems with uh, starvation and such across the country. Well, more than 140 trillion calories are being dumped in the United States landfills every year. So that's a, a situation we really have to figure out how we're gonna get fixed as well. So just from the monetary aspect real quick, yes, most of the, the waste occurs in the homeowner situation, but there is way, there is a lot in the way of financial loss occurs with grocery stores, about 57 billion. And then the, the farms also have a $15 billion problem with this. So the opportunities that are there, we just gotta be flexible and figure out how we potentially might uh, alleviate some of these problems. What types of problems might we think about with respect to food waste? Well, maybe we need to optimize our harvest somewhat in a better manner. If, if we figure out that the market is not gonna be able to support us growing 30,000 acres of sweet corn in January, well, maybe we need to back that down a little bit. There's gonna to have to be improvements across the supply chain overall in, in how we go about leveraging new technology to create smart systems to improve efficiencies. And that's gonna involve harvest, transportation, uh, the maintenance and the quality of uh, and our shelf life aspects, all that sort of thing. We, of course, as this year has proven, we're gonna to have to strengthen the food rescue system. Uh, the food banks just cannot handle things logistically the way they're designed. So we're gonna to have to work with them, partner with them in trying to figure out how we can do more of efficient system along these lines. And we're gonna to have to do figure out more and do more research along the lines of recycling products that remaining. And by this, I'm talking about you know, whatever, banana peels, uh, apple cores, peach pits, whatever. All of that takes tremendous amounts of energy to get it to where it is. We've got to figure out how to harness that energy and get it back into the system in some type of an efficient manner. Now, maybe that's going to just involve research on how to potentially uh, come up with varieties that are more hardier, longer lasting, like that keepsake strawberry we mentioned. There's going to have to be much more in the way of, of automation research take place so that we can figure out there's no sense in taking a product and packaging it and running it through the entire supply chain and then just have it go to the landfill ultimately we want it, if that's going to be called we want it to be called right in the field so we can save that energy and there's probably going to have to be a lot done with respect to the packaging aspects and coming up with new types of, of containers that maintain humidity and that sort of thing to potentially uh, reduce loss and that sort of thing so like I said, the other aspect that Amanda wanted me to talk about today had to do with future opportunities. 
Now, this is there again, a lot in the way, we're, this is going to demand a lot in the way of flexibility and a lot in the way of potentially working outside our typical comfort zones. Of course, this past year was unprecedented in the way things happened for not only growers, but for retailers and for shoppers alike. Uh, no doubt that the food re retailing landscape has changed for good. Notice it doesn't say for the good, it says it has changed for good. There's, there's the grocery store business was actually the business to be in during 2020. It, uh, the data show that because of the fact that nobody was, everyone was working at home, nobody was going on vacation, schools were closed, et cetera. Everybody was getting their food from primarily from the grocery store. So there was a 35% jump in sales at the store levels during 2020. And, you know, produce was a good part of that. Fresh produce sales were up about 11% and frozen fruit and veg sales were up almost 30%. And I can believe that because a lot of times when you went to the store, the, the, those shelves were empty for good amounts of time. So what do those percentages equate to from a dollar standpoint? And this is at the store level, not at the grower level, but you can see the amount of money that came in from selling tomatoes during 2020 was over 20% higher of what it was during 2019. The same sort of thing for, for peppers, they're almost 20%. Uh, potatoes are right up there at 20%, sweet corn 44%, citrus almost 50%. So there's a lot in the way of, of value that was attained at the store levels because of fresh commodities. Now, something else that's really going to change with respect to the, the, the purchase of fruit and veg going forward is the fact that online grocery is now a totally new and completely established sector. It's here to stay, no doubt about it. From the data I was able to find, it showed that online sales during 2020 for food pro products grew more than 90% just last year. And to give you a number, an idea of the, the, the variance of that, from 2018 to 2019, that increase was only 3%, whereas last year it was 90%. And the experts are saying that the online purchases could total as much as 20% of total sales by 2025. And I really believe that because as the next bullet shows, we're already up to about 10% of all grocery shopping occurring online. So what do all of these percentages equate to from a, from a dollar standpoint? Well, then looking at the data from just last month, more than $9.3 billion occurred in online fruit and vegetable sales, 9.3 billion. And that involved almost 70 million households placing an order of almost, placing almost three different orders during the course of one month. That's a lot of money in one month that we can really be taking advantage of and trying to figure out how can we, we can exploit more to our, our advantage. And I'm gonna to have to pick it up the pace a little bit here, but one thing that uh, we did notice, it's not all good when it comes to online sales because it, online is a very different experience. It's a very different decision process. The data show that online shoppers, more than half of them purchase less fruit and veg than they do if they are actually in the store. That's because of the fact that buying fruits and veg is, is very much a sensory decision process. They wanna see it, they wanna smell it, they wanna feel it. You can't do that, of course, online. So we're gonna to have to figure out how we can better take advantage of the online situation to get more in the way of online sales occurring because more than half of those folks who are already buying online are not gonna go back to shopping at the store kind of thing. Now, one component that's gonna be a real part of this process is gonna involve packaging. There again, we're not typically used to the packaging conversation and our scientific and technical aspects, but this is something we're going to have to be more flexible on. And, and even though it's not on inside our, our typical comfort zone, we're going to have to do more with respect to the packaging aspect, aspects. Even when we're talking about packaging in store, well, of course, consumers are much more uh, favorable now to purchasing product that's packaged versus bulk. We've all seen it where somebody will go in and grab one apple, put it back, grab a second apple, look at it, put it back, grab a third apple, look at it, put it back, and then finally put the fourth one in their bag. Well, nobody wants to purchase something that's been handled by umpteen different people umpteen number of times. So package product is, sales of package products is exponential over what bulk has been during this last year. But there's gonna be a balance that's gonna to have to occur with respect to food safety situations. We're gonna to have to show that it's temper proof. Uh, we're gonna to have to improve the quality of the aspects of the components that are in the package. We're gonna to have to <laughs> deal with sustainability. That's gonna be another point of conversation for later today. So 
those sort of things are all going to confuse and, con and, and convolute this whole packaging situation never, at, that we're trying to deal with. But at the same time, we've still got to optimize the experience somehow. And how can we improve the quality of the choices that they're potentially proving or purchasing from their in-store purchases? And the same sort of thing is going to carry over to when they're purchasing online. Uh, we're going to have to rethink what's how things are, are purchased online and how can we better package those online components. And when it comes to the same sustainability aspects that are obviously going to be a part of online, well, those all, of course, are going to have higher costs that we're going to have to deal with too, because you cannot pass those costs on to pass a grower level usually. So we're going to have to do a lot in the way of, of new and innovative packaging solutions and trying to, at the same time, minimize the use of non-compostable -compost plastic, because there again, we have to think about the food waste standpoint. So we're gonna to have to somehow think outside the box, be flexible and come up with our perfect produce packaging that somehow meets all the innovation requirements that's necessary. And, and while I do so, we're probably gonna to have to establish a number of uncommon industry partnerships at the same time. And even when we think we might have come up with a perfect packaging situation, well, it might not always be the case. Here we've got a situation where we thought, well, here's a product that's, you know, it's tamper proof, it's, uh, it's in, it, it, in a fairly si an accept acceptable size portion kind of thing. Um, but if I do my translations here correctly, I think this is, translates to it's, it's lamb's lettuce, uh, fresh and washed. Well, yeah, it might be all that, but you're getting a little bit of, if you look close, you're getting a little bit of free protein within that package. So even when we think we potentially might have a solution, we're going to have to still do more in the way of refinement around those types of aspects because they are going to arise. Fresh produce companies who are switching from the food service aspect to the market, retail market are going to need to rethink a lot of their packaging and packaging technologies to accommodate requirements of smaller package sizes, increased graphics, increased shelf lives, things of that nature. Because remember, 60% of the Florida fruit and veg product had been going to food service, and we're going to have to pivot that and somehow get it so it's more either retail or online sort of situations. Now, very quickly, obviously the, the, the local, grown local aspect is gonna maintain its, its strength. We've seen that more so this past year because uh, Florida, you know, our, our farmers are considered much more essential and they're, they're very much more appreciated in what they do from the consumer level. So communities are gonna defend the farmers more going forward. We might see more in the way of improvements with respect to green, sa green space maintenance, that kind of thing. Uh, we're gonna have to very much plan for the use of increased automation, mechanization and robotics as a part of, of, of both farming and packaging in, in the Florida sector. We've already got situations where there are strawberry, there are robotic strawberry harvesters available. There are prototypes in the field. So we're gonna have to figure out how to best utilize that and how to best use the packaging that are a part of those components. And of course, the digital platforms are, have proven their worth this past year on how to connect farmers with consumers, and that's only going to expand. So there again, we might have to work outside our comfort zone and figure out what kind of future opportunity we can utilize to improve that situation. Some of the trends, of course, we've been talking about involve, revolve around the fact that there is so much a way of, of dining going on at home because they're working at home, schools are closed, restaurants are closed, not going on vacation. So there's a lot in the way of going on with respect to uh, new cooking habits within the home. So here's a future opportunity we might not, that we've not been in, but we might need to be thinking about. How can we better improve that situation because consumers are gonna get most of their fruit and veg for consumption at home. So how can we help them and foster increased consumption? And we'll have to do more in the way of introduction of new value added type products and think about those kind of situations. What kind of value added products? Well, ready to cook, ready to eat, heat and eat, grab and go. We'll have to provide potentially entire home meal solutions in the various packaging that we're putting together. And of course, easy snacking options that might be possible with some of our product because innovations that are introduced now during this time of disruption are going to have the potential to impact all kinds of future purchasing habits and consumption habits. So this is where I'm asking you guys to be thinking about how you can make impacts, because even if it's going into those packages, it's, it's going to depend on how it's grown, what's grown, the size, the shape, all those sort of components are going to be a part of this whole over, overall equation. 
And just what I'd like to emphasize here, like I said, we talked about the fact there'll be new strategic partnerships. I mean, a couple of years ago, who would ever thought that Amazon would be selling tomatoes directly to consumers, but they are. Those sort of things are happening. So we've got to figure out what the long-term behavioral pat purchasing patterns and marketing patterns and marketing channels and product preferences are going to be going forward so that we can drive how sales occur and how shopping occurs for years to come. There again, more in the way of being flexible, taking advantage of a future opportunity, be thinking about those these sort of things because you being the leaders, your companies, your employees are gonna be looking to you for this, these kind of solutions. Uh, there's gonna be a lot going on with respect to what's going on with newness and freshness and authenticity because since everybody is eating at home so much, uh, well, they're going to get fatigued to that real quick. And mom's recipes that she has had for 10 years might just not carry it going forward. So we're going to have to be impactful in how we kind of come up with these sort of new ideas that we can use for consumers to assist them in purchasing more product and increasing consumption. And of course, we'll have to do this. There's going to be, have to be a lot in the way of ingenuity that's going to have to occur. And you can put any adverb you want to on that, an innovative, novel, original, modernized, inventive, whatever. We just need to be thinking about those kind of things to get us to that next level. So it might be good for everybody to really be focusing on in innovative new ways to present and communicate your products using packaging, new channels to reach buyers, those, those sort of components to, that you can uh, use to your advantage. Be flexible in how you come up with those. Use that as a future opportunity, even though it might be outside your comfort zone. Develop those new value-added products that we might be talking about. And that's gonna include research in the product, how it's grown and the flavors it has, new varieties, those ready to cook options, that kind of thing. We're gonna to have to do, this group in particular is gonna to have to do a lot with respect to researching and developing improvements on the products. Those, so those ideas, those innovative and novel approaches are gonna come from you guys. And we have, to, we have to do that, and they'll be, they'll be able to offer fresh and unexpected new ways of joining fruit and veg to increase consumption. And of course, packaging and media and all those other components are going to have to be a part of this because ultimately it's going to be a part of the ultimate solution that we're all working towards. So just keep in mind that everything you do, from how you plan it, to how you grow it, to how you pick it, to how you market it, it's all going to play into being successful. And this, it's all going to be hyper strategic from this point on. And it's all going to depend on, a lot of it's going to depend on you guys because there are benefits to seize and advancements to make if we stay flexible and if we take the time to reflect on what has been and envision what can be. So yeah, I, I, from a future opportunity standpoint, I just emphasize be as flexible as you can, be willing to work outside your comfort zone and hopefully good things will come back your direction. So at this point, as I've gone one minute over, uh, if there are any questions that anybody's got that they want to knock the door down, be willing to take those on if we could. Mike, that was just excellent. And I have to tell you from the comments that we're seeing in the chat, it, it is really, uh, it, it's really been an inspiring presentation uh, this, this morning. And so um, with that, uh, do we have questions? You can either, uh, 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 raise your hand or you can uh, comment in the chat if you have a question. Mike, this is uh, uh, Joel Brennemiel. Just just a quick question. Uh, you know, where do you where do you see the the you pick in all of this? And is is that going to potentially increase and become more popular or is or is that kind of reached its peak? No, I think people are looking for more in the way of adventures since they aren't going on vacations and they aren't, are not getting out of the house much. That's something that you can easily and simply do with a family or whatever. Just load everybody up if a, if a farm is close by and, and then get the kids some experience in what tomatoes look like, what strawberries look like, whatever. Uh, the only hang up that's going to be a part of that you pick situation is going to be the lawyers, liability. Some, if somebody turns an ankle stepping on a stepping over a, a bed kind of thing, well, now the grower could potentially be liable for if, if that person broke their leg or something. So those kind of aspects are going to have to be considered, and you're going to have to make, make sure you got all your errors and omissions insurances type thing in place before going down those roads. But yeah, there are there there are opportunities there. 
just because of the fact that people are wanting to, they've been housebound. They want to get out. I have a question too. So like, I know we had a lot of waste, food waste from, and from production with the COVID thing. I, and I don't know enough about this, but are there like already associations? Like why couldn't we, I know we don't produce some of our tomatoes for canning, but like we could have, could we have not? I mean, I'm not sure the difference in like, you know, produce used for different type of long term storage op op options or opportunities for those farmers. You're absolutely right. Those type of innovations have to be looked at, have to be defined better. Um, because like I said, the old way of what we've been doing things, it's just not going to work anymore going forward. Like I also said, there's going to be EPA legislation come down on the landfills. We're going to have to figure out how to get those volumes down. And we'd better do it so that we just do it under a guide guideline type of situation as to as opposed to a regulation situation. So any kind of innovation that we can do along those lines that you're just mentioning, oh, that's 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 golden. Mike, this yeah. is can I ask yeah, the next uh, question might be from Hannah Tong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's okay. I feel like that's not the best uh, going forward. So I'll just unmute my mic. Um, so thank you for your talk. And just to piggyback off of what Clayton asked, who do you get in contact with to go about developing this innovative thought process and these strategies? Is it with uh, certain organizations that you had in mind to talk about, you know, food storage moving forward? Like what companies are working towards these new innovative thoughts for fruit and vegetable production? Yeah, Anna, that's a good question because all of this is so new on the front end of the curve. There are not a lot of situations that are available to brainstorm collectively that I'm aware of kind of thing. So these are some areas that we could we can define it. Maybe we should be the ones designing how these type of systems should be established and, and where you know efficiencies could be worked into the system. They're again, giving us more control. Yeah, because I'm feeling more like a capstone kind of innovative business idea for DPM students from this idea, um, just coming up with problem solving course and you know we get some brains together and, and propose a new strategy for this Man, you're right on target well, that's really great i see that blair siegfried had a question blair mike i really enjoyed your your comments and thoughts um i'm wondering with with the changes that we're seeing in the fresh produce and the demand for healthy um choices is there an opportunity for integrated pest management where we are um, reducing pesticide input in food production to make that a strategy for increasing profitability to growers? Blair, I think we're gonna have to um, because a lot of these new partnerships that we're working with and even some of the existing partnerships we're working with, there's a lot in the way of, for instance, secondary standards that are being placed on product. Even though, and I'll just use um, chemical tolerance as an example. If, if EPA has a tolerance on the books for chemical X on product Y, very often some of these retail and online sectors will also have their own tolerance number that they want the product to adhere to. And it's often very much lower than the EPA established tolerance. So yeah, the, we're gonna have to be very innovative and in trying to figure out how can we potentially reduce things on the, on the input side of things, especially on chemical fertilizer, water, all those sort of aspects, so that we can meet the requirements that are going to be handed down to us. So yeah, there again, that's we're going to be right in the wheelhouse of the DPM program and how to figure out how we can better exploit the IPM situation. Um, I had a quick question. Hi, Mike, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I know that you talked a bit about food waste and we're kind of expanding on what's going on with our landfills. This is kind of expanding on like what Hannah and Clay were asking. Where do you think we're at in Florida or even on a countrywide scale with our composting efforts? And how do you think we can improve on that moving forward? Yeah, that's a good question because Florida has not got a lot in the way of, of you know, specificity and, and, and they don't rank real high in respect to compost situations. So 
yeah, I don't really know what to offer as far as uh, potential directions we might be able to go down because, you know, we, we, Florida is kind of limited just because of the, the land availability aspects, but maybe there's some modification and manipulation we can do to other situations to where we can um, incorporate some composting facilities into areas to where they would be um, approvable or allowable. We've had situations where they've tried to establish, um, for instance, a horse manure composting facility in the Everglades agricultural area. Well, that sounds good and yeah, it would be a potential solution for the horse manure aspects, but at the same time, now you're introducing a huge manure component into a geographical area that grows fresh, unwashed produce. So you have to be careful in that there's no cross-contamination and, and ultimately that facility was shot down just because of the fact that it was deemed to, to be too big of a risk from the potential cross-contamination. You know, if, it, if, it, if the dike blew during a, during a big rainstorm and all that manure washed into the canal, well then no grower could use that canal water downstream because of the contamination aspects. So there's a, there's a place for additional composting situations. We're just gonna have to be careful and be very thoughtful in how we design and in how we locate those type of situations. But yeah, I, I fully agree. The opportunities for composting are there. Well, that's great. It looks like Sharon uh, Wingarten has uh, his hand raised. Sharon, do you have a, a comment or question? Yes, hi, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, in the middle or in the beginning of um, your talk, you mentioned a couple of times um, that the USDA doesn't understand the complexity of specialty crops. Uh, I think you were uh, discussing, you know, the $250,000 maximum, I guess, grant aid. Um, is FFVA, I guess, right? I mean, they're lobbying um, like Marco Rubio and, and, uh, and our senators, Rick Scott, uh, for I guess more funds and farm bills, is that, is that occurring? So they do understand the importance and the uniqueness of our specialty crop industry? Well, what we're trying to do first is get more in the way of education across to the USDA folks and the, the, the farm service agency folks. You know, a lot, it, it's, it's, not under, it's not unrealistic because a lot of the USDA people just have not had the exposure to specialty crop agriculture. So it's, you know, it's, I guess in a way it's, it's partially our fault for not educating them to the degree in which they really need to be educated to make educated decisions on a lot of this sort of thing. So what we're, we, once we've already talked about, once things smooth out a little bit and we return to some sort of pseudo normalcy, doing much more in a way of bringing USDA personnel down to Florida, exposing them to Florida agriculture, letting them see for themselves how the system works, letting them see for themselves the reasons why we have to do things the way we do, get, have them get a better appreciation and understanding for why it takes this type of input cost to do this type of commodity. Um, with respect to doing any kind of legislative deal with the Rubio or Scott or anybody like that, we, I don't think we've really went down that road. They've been very supportive in what we've been trying to do with respect to uh, these various assistance programs with USDA. Don't, don't doubt that a bit. They've been hugely helpful in helping us get all this through when we did. I think we just have to do a little more in, in the way of just educating, educating our USDA counterparts in DC so that they um, have an under, a baseline understanding better. And what about the Mexican imports that are flooding, I guess, uh, the market? And, you know, it's a not fair competition, I guess, to our, to our growers. What are we doing to, I guess, even the playing field? Well, that's the, we could spend the whole rest of the day talking about that one. Yeah, there's a lot going on with respect to the import import situation and, and trying to get that resolved to a degree. But remember, we just had the, the brand new USMCA put into place. So, and, and under USMCA, it's not just Florida specialty crop, it's national, it's North America. So we've got other specialty crop industries such as apples and commodities such as, such as that, telling Florida to not, they, they're telling us do no harm. USMCA is working, don't screw it up. But it is screwed up when you talk about Southeast United States agriculture. So we're trying to find where there could be some sort of a sweet spot in trying to figure out how we might be able to get more in the way of improvements to Southeastern 
produce growers because we just tried to do this uh, section 201 with the U.S. International Trade Committee and, and their analysis on it, that was particular to blueberry. But there was a problem there and that while the Southeast U.S. had its own concerns on, as a part of this 201 petition, while the 201 petition involved the entire country and while we could, we could prove impacts on Southeast blueberry, there was a problem in proving impacts on U.S. blueberry. So therefore U.S. ITC dismissed that 201 petition based on the fact that it didn't impact blueberries across the country. What the, what the solutions are going forward with respect to imports and making a more level playing field, man, if you got other ideas and suggestions along those lines, we'd love to hear them because we're fighting that battle constantly. We have someone in the office who basically that's all they do is, is deal with ITC, deal with, um, the, the, it used to be Mr. Lighthouser's office now and so now there's new personnel in there so yeah there's a lot going on with respect to trade but we looking for always looking for new and new ideas with respect to how we can improve the trade aspects for especially produce in the southeast u.s and this is this has been an outstanding discussion i really appreciate it you know this time uh, jenny i see that your hand is raised as well if, if you could place your your question in the chat we're going to take a five minute break and there will be time for more questions with our discussion panel. And uh, Nicole Casuso and Tim Durham will be reading, leading that discussion panel and we will resume at 1120. So thank you so much for the uh, excellent feedback, but I want to give our speakers just a few minutes uh, to take a, a brief break for stretch, uh, bath, restroom break and uh, caffeine if they need it. So five minutes, we will return. Thank you so much. So we'll begin here in a moment, but really appreciate all the wonderful participation and that we even have some of, some of our participants from as far as Egypt, it seems. So really interesting to see where everyone is joining from. One advantage of, uh, of virtual. And so with that, uh, I would like to uh, hand the meeting over to uh, Dr. Tim Durham and Dr. Nicole Casuso for the roundtable discussion that we will be beginning. Okay, it looks like I'm up and running now. So good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Nicole and I are co-chairing this, this upcoming uh, panel discussion. I'm gonna be posting a, a PowerPoint with the questions. So that's kind of at the forefront the entire time. I know it could be a little bit disorienting sometimes when panelists are you know, bombarded with questions and then you kind of go do a double take. Did I kind of thoroughly answer that? Am I missing any elements? So that's gonna be posted on screen continuously. And we're gonna cycle through a series of, it's five to six questions. And Nicole and I are basically gonna hand off responsibilities. So whoever is not uh, charged with that particular question moderating at the time, the other individual, the other co-chair will be monitoring the chat for questions. So that's another venue that you can all use to pose questions in real time. With that said, I want to hand off to Nicole and she's going to take care of the, the panelist self-introductions. Thank you very much, Tim, and good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to see the level of attendance that we have for this and very thankful for Tim to include uh, some of those instructions uh, for all of us participating in terms of getting that scope of diversity of those in attendance, um, as well as just some of the more technological ways of navigating through this app that I think we're all becoming increasingly more familiar with, um, the Zoom platform. But without further ado, I'd like to try the uh, popcorn technique to allow the panelists to kind of introduce themselves and then kind of pass the torch to one of the other panelists. Um, so if you don't mind just introducing uh, yourself with your name, uh, your affiliation and how long you've currently been in uh, your present role. Um, and if Ms. Yunette James Mack, if you'd be willing to kickstart our panelist introductions, um, that would be fantastic. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Yunette James Mack, and I would like to say first thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be a part of this panel. 
I work for the US Customs and Border Protection and I am currently the Florida Agriculture Liaison uh, for CBP, which is Customs and Border Protection. So um, moving forward, most likely you will hear me say CBP. Um, I have been in this position since 2012, so approximately eight going on nine years. And um, I'm stationed here in Gainesville, Florida, and I do liaise uh, with the USDA APHIS uh, PPQ, uh, Plant Protection and Quarantine, as well as the uh, veterinary side of APHIS, as well as the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry. So I'm glad to be here and I um, definitely enjoyed the former uh, presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Miss Gina, if you'd like to call on one of the other panelists or I can uh, to introduce themselves and we can kind of go around the, the table that way, the virtual table. <laughs> yes, please go ahead, uh, Nicole. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so let's, um, Mr. Bob Hockmuth, go ahead. You're next on my screen. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, also, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this today. Uh, I'm a uh, an extension agent, a long time extension agent. I started my career in uh, Delaware and uh, have been down here in Florida for a little over 30 years. So altogether, this is my 40th year serving as an extension agent, uh, both in Delaware and Florida. I'm housed at a uh, research and education center, the North Florida Research and Education Center, Swanee Valley, which is in Live Oak and serve that region uh, specifically for commercial vegetable producers in this uh, in this area. So I have a kind of a combination of applied research kinds of activities, but for the most part, I'm working directly with growers, helping them to adopt a number of uh, uh, different practices on their on their farms. I'm originally from the Eastern shore of Maryland and my uh, education was in extension education and entomology. Glad to be here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next, I have uh, Dr. Hugh Smith on the screen here. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this. Uh, my name is Hugh Smith. I am the vegetable entomologist at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center, which is near Tampa. I got both my master's and PhD uh, in the Department of Entomology and Nematology in Gainesville in the 90s. and worked in some other places uh, for about 10 years and came back uh, to the University of Florida 10 years ago. Uh, so just early 2011 was when I started uh, my current position um, as a vegetable entomologist uh, based there at Baum. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and then on to our other Dr. Smith, Dr. Trevor Smith, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. And uh, yeah, I echo the uh, appreciation for being able to participate. I am the director of the Division of Plant Industry and the state plant regulatory official. Um, the Division of Plant Industry is responsible for uh, protecting our agricultural natural resources and um, honeybee resources in the state of Florida, within the state of Florida. So everything outside of the ports, uh, responding to fruit fly outbreaks, dealing with uh, quarantine issues, um, inspecting our 16,000 plant nurseries, uh, all of that early detection and rapid response is what we're responsible for. Uh, my background, my PhD is in uh, entomology. Um, I've been in my current position as director for about six years, but I've been with DPI for almost 17. In fact, I took my very first job here as a laboratory technician before I had even finished my PhD program over at UF. So uh, this is where I've always wanted to be. From the beginning, this is where I want to be, where I wanted to be and responding to a lot of these uh, major constant exotic pest introductions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And um, last but not least, we did have our keynote speaker, but I also ask that he uh, sit in as participant of this round table. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Ertz. Yeah, Mike Ertz, the Director of Science and Regulatory Affairs at Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association. I've been with FFEA for a little over 20 years, but I started when I was 12. 
All right, thank you. And we definitely have a very diverse panel trying to touch not just geographically the range of our states, but also uh, from the regulatory extension academia and industry perspectives. Um, so with that, I will pass the uh, virtual mic over to Tim to kickstart our discussion with our panel. Looks good, okay. And please disregard the, the timestamps. We're not going to abide by those, but we will like to allot 15 minutes or so to each question. So with that said, let me use uh, the term Kickstarter again. This is an appropriate question for our series of panelists. What's your definition of agricultural sustainability and how does it intersect with your specific field of expertise? Yes, this is Bob. I'll, I'll give it a start. Um, I uh, think about this and working directly with a farmers uh, that I uh, that I do engage with on a regular basis and and certainly there's I think I think of this as different components of sustainability and probably as we move as we have moved forward there's there's new additions that were maybe not quite as important in the past that seem to take on a much larger role today uh, but certainly to be able to to have sustainability of a of a, a farm uh, situation, you know, having a productive system, uh, having a, a whole farm approach to things where we're going to be able to produce safe, safe, safe uh, food and fiber certainly is one of those components. The farmer has to be economically viable, so there needs to be a profitability aspect uh, to that as well uh, for him to be him or her to be able to sustain the farm. And uh, more and more, we are uh, looking at different natural resources and the impacts of how those natural resources affect sustainability. So certainly uh, soil health is, uh, is more and more uh, vivid as we work our way through. In this area where I am in the Suwannee Valley area, water quality and water supply is really important for the long-term sustainability of the farms certainly throughout the state, but in, in the Suwannee Valley area, just a little uh, factoid that there's more, there's more springs in this region than there is anywhere in the world. Um, so it's it, the springs and protecting those springs is a really important piece of the regional sustainability for agriculture as well. So uh, I think in, Mark, in Mike's uh, presentation earlier, Mike mentioned a number of different, uh, I think he called them sort of the second degree uh, requirements, but uh, buyers now have sustainability requirements in many cases for farmers to be able to, uh, to sell to them. So that's one of those that I think that Mike was referring to. So I think you, you put all those things together, you gotta be able to have a productive system you got to be able to have a profit for the farm and you got to be able to uh, protect the natural resources that are involved on that land. I don't really like the term sustainability because it's very ambiguous and it's, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question with what I'm going to say, but it's been around for decades. And the fact that, you know, we're still trying to determine what it, what it means. Um, and particularly since, since we've got a lot of students on this call, I think it's, it's worth considering. Um, I remember being a graduate school in uh, graduate student and, this, this question came out, what does sustainability mean? And there were various examples of what is not sustainable. And I remember one had to do with uh, hog production or pig production, and there were excess nitrates that got into groundwater, which has various negative health consequences, not impacting the actual farm, but in the surrounding community. And that was described as unsustainable. And another, another example is one in the area where I work, it, which is overuse or improper use of insecticides, which you get resistance and that ultimately is not sustainable, but really, so you've got using, you're using one term to describe two completely different things, something internal to the production and something totally external. So it's kind of an ambiguous term. And I think we're just talking about being responsible. I think when you're saying sustainability, but we're ultimately, if you boil it down, we're talking about um, responsibility. Um, and the other, reason that it's a little too ambiguous for me is that sustainability, the term obviously has a time aspect to it, but what is that time aspect? I, in 1995, when I started my PhD, I was, um, I started doing my research up in Quincy and I spent a lot of time on I-10 and I would pass this hand-painted sign. It was red and black letters and it would move around 
And the sign said, repent, last warning. And every single time I saw that sign, it would make me think about what is, what is the definition of sustainability? At what point does something not become sustainable? I mean, I think people have been doing unsustainable things for, for a long time. So I'm being a little bit of a devil's advocate in my response to this question. And I just, to the students and the recent graduates, I think it's, it's important to think about phrases like this that, have been, that are kind of ambiguous. They're kind of shorthand. We think we're all talking about the same thing. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to students to just be, 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 be clear that you're saying, saying what you mean in your own words. So, um, but I guess the short answer is, I, I think it's, you know, we're talking about really just being responsible and any, any different numbers, any different aspects of the term responsible. And he was exactly right with respect to the confusion that's around sustainability. You ask 10 people for their definition of sustainability, you're gonna get 12 answers. And me being an overly, overly simplistic person, I define sustainability with three words, preservation of resources. And that's gonna incorporate a lot of things, of course, and it's gonna use soil, it's gonna use water, it's gonna be a limiting contribution to the waste stream, those kind of things. But I think it all reverts right back to preservation of resources. Hi, I'd like to chime in, and if I'm to uh, be honest, I had to actually uh, look, uh, research or look up the definition of uh, sustainable agriculture, um, being that that, of course, is not my um, expertise. Um, and, and what I got was an integrated system of plant and animal production practices uh, that will over the long term satisfy human food and fiber needs. But from my um, expertise or, or the work that I've been doing with the federal government, um, I would like to just say that the agriculture mission within CDP is a critical facet um, in protecting US agriculture and its natural resources and the homeland. So the CBP agriculture specialist within uh, the Office of Field Operations, which is a part of uh, Customs and Border Protection, they use their specialized skill set uh, to protect American agriculture and the food supply by mitigating or preventing the introduction of harmful exotic plant pests and foreign animal diseases. And of course, potential agrobioterrorism um, into the United States. So we see ourselves as the first line of defense um, in protecting the US agriculture. And of course, um, once the commodities or uh, food, food supply comes into uh, the country, from there, uh, we turn it over uh, to individuals like uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Trevor Smith <laughs> from the Division of Plant Industry. I must um, say though that um, we, uh, CBP does work uh, closely uh, with the USDA, um, APHIS. Um, our goal, of course, is to um, enforce the regulations uh, for the USDA. So we partner very closely with them in uh, most of the operations that we do at the ports of entry. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I think the uh, panelists kind of covered the questions about agricultural sustainability. I think I'm really gonna be hitting hard on the next question uh, because the two obviously are really tied together as far as where, where we intersect with sustainability. And it really is kind of falling back on what you Ned just said. Um, <clears throat> we're dealing with a lot of the external. We're dealing with the pest and disease issues, trying to keep them out, trying to mitigate them once they're here. Then once they're here, trying to come up with solutions so the farmers can keep producing, uh, keep exporting, keep getting uh, their product out there. So um, yeah, I think I'll, most of my comments are probably gonna be directed at the, at the next question down the line. So um, I'll kind of leave it at that. Wonderful. Um, then that seems like a really good segue for us to uh, move to the, the next question, um, specifically that when it we're talking about food security and food safety, what would be some of the, and I'll use some air quotes here, uh, the usual suspects or challenges that we face uh, with food security and food safety? 
And on the flip side, what would be some emerging problems that maybe don't get as much of the appropriate attention, whether it's in the media, um, amongst industry professionals, or at the teaching extension or research level? Well, you know, I can jump right in here on this one. So the challenges and the usual suspects, and I'm gonna take this from a Florida perspective, but it, it goes far beyond Florida. The number of invasive arthropods and plant diseases we deal with every year just keeps on increasing. We average about 30 every year now. So every two weeks, we have a new introduction. And I'm not talking about um, you know, something showing up at the porch that's, that stopped at the porch. I'm talking about things that are established, become established in Florida. And it's this, this never ending revolving door that we have to deal with uh, responding to these things. And it's, you look at something like tomatoes in South Florida, I mean, you can barely, barely get a crop in under your profit margin anymore, just because this constant influx of pests and diseases has built and built and built and built. You're at this threshold now where, you know, a, a, a small white fly outbreak all of a sudden breaks the bank because you're already dealing with all of these other issues. And there's several issues here that we can tackle that are part of the problem. One of them is we have to hold our trade partners to the same standard we hold our own farmers. The more I get involved in this, the more I look at what's going on with uh, the various commodities and other countries coming in, the more I realize it is so incredibly un unbalanced and it's through no fault of USDA PPQ, APHIS PPQ, or UNET and CBP, this is where the State Department gets involved or the trade side of USDA gets involved and they will railroad any kind of safeguarding uh, issues to get a trade deal through. It could, it could have something to do with something we don't even know. They wanna build an air base somewhere in a foreign nation and the way you can do that is you take their watermelon. And we know for a fact that their phytosanitary measures aren't even close to our standards. Or for instance, we have a fruit fly outbreak in Florida. We have 96 hours to inform all of our trade partners that not only have we had an outbreak, we've quarantined it and we're starting eradication procedures. Our other trade partners don't have to do that. We have no idea if there's an outbreak. Usually when we find out, it's through other means, it's through sources we have in those other countries. Mexico is a great example. Three or four years ago, they had a huge, enormous outbreak of Mediterranean fruit fly. Those growers were, they continued to export. They were able to move their fruit and produce out of that area. And they were able to put a, a label on it, fly free zone. We find two fruit flies in Florida. That whole area is quarantined. The growers cannot move it without going through a whole host of uh, post-harvest, pre-harvest treatments, and even then some are just too risky, we won't even send them out. So I want to give everybody plenty of time on this one, but um, that's a huge issue for us. And then another issue as far as emerging that I think a lot of people, I, I think it ties in nicely with what Mike was talking about, but I'm thinking more internationally is the mail, parcel services. Yes, the ports are bringing in the volume of produce, but they're going through CBP and USDA inspections. Uh, sure, stuff can get through, but it's a pretty tight operation. The mail, I could try, I could just go ahead and, and find somebody out there in Vietnam and say, hey, I'd like to have a bunch of your mangoes, send them to me. Okay, it's in the mail. Maybe it gets caught by the canine units at the international mail facilities, Maybe it gets caught with our canines once it's into the domestic uh, marketplace, but the sheer volume is such that that stuff gets through all the time. And all it takes is one mango with a bunch of fruit fly larvae. Somebody opens up the package, they see a bunch of maggots, toss it outside. We've got a multi-million dollar eradication program and the entire state of Florida has the potential to be quarantined. Um, so it's not just damage to fruit and vegetables, it's the fact that once a quarantine's in place and we can't export and we can't move our product, it, it might as well have all been destroyed. So 
that's an area just on the on part B where I think people are aware there's a lot of I mean everybody's aware of Amazon and everything right now but the fact that you can move fruit uh, anywhere at any time is is a much more to me presently a much bigger issue because we haven't wrapped our arms around it with that I'll, I'll pass it on Yes, uh, Trevor, I, I will just uh, chime in to definitely uh, support exactly what you're saying. That has been uh, my, my trend um, or my thought in responding to this question as well. And um, the, the introduction of, of the various harmful plant pests and animal diseases, for example, um, the fruit flies you mentioned, Medi Mediterranean, Oriental, Caribbean, um, other um, destructive uh, pests such as Asian gypsy moths, the giant African land snail that you're all too familiar with. Um, now, uh, recently, the horntail snail, uh, the capra beetle in stored grains, uh, the avian disease uh, via smuggled birds, uh, domestic spreads such as uh, the spotted lantern fly and wood boring insects that may move uh, via firewood and imported uh, wood products. So these are just the challenges that we encounter on, on a daily basis and some of the areas that uh, CBP has focused their resources in mitigating the risk uh, to the state uh, department of the, the state agriculture and, and working along with the state department of agriculture uh, to combat these diseases. And definitely in the male environment, as you mentioned, that has been one of the major challenges uh, for CBP on a whole. Um, yes, we are able to uh, target uh, some of these packages, but as you mentioned, the overwhelming volume. And we saw a recent uh, example of that with the seed packets um, that were um, unsolicited seed packets that were coming in all over the country um, from foreign countries. So these are just uh, definitely some of the areas that have been challenging to both the, the federal government, the state government, uh, the USDA. I know that um, the, the uh, CITSI, and I hesitate to, to call the, the Smuggling Introduction and Trade Compliance Group, they do uh, work very diligently to address some of these concerns, especially um, in the male environment. But you knock those two um, things right on the head. They, they are accurate in terms of some of the challenges that we have faced. And, and it is a domino effect because in, in the long run, it definitely affects the food security and food safety of our, of our country. Thank you. I'm gonna take a stab at the other part of this. I think um, most of the comments to this point are more related maybe to the food security issue. I'd just like to tackle a little bit on the food safety side of things. And when I think back in the early part of my career that here towards the end of my career, I would be working with food safety. Uh, that would be a very, would have been a very foreign thought years ago. Um, but about 10 years ago, uh, we have had to sort of reinvent ourselves, I think, to some degree as an extension agent, uh, either regional or county faculty, working directly with farmers. And it became obvious, at least in my role, working with uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, that one of the greatest needs that the farmers had was how to adopt the requirements for, uh, for food safety. And when you think about uh, most of those operations, they, there really is no training uh, typically, there's no training within that farm to handle things like food safety and the audits that are required for them to be able to ship now. So um, a couple of things that happen there, the one of the challenges uh, in, in the food safety part of the things for the farmers is it's a very expensive uh, program. And in most large operations, there's actually a food safety division that has emerged where there's full-time employees that manage uh, that for the farms. When you get down to medium or small operations, usually uh, they, they're not able to afford uh, someone to be able to be full-time to do that. So they've got a little bit more of a struggle. The smaller the operation, the more the struggle would be um, to, to be able to justify the implementation of that. So uh, for 
for us, we've um, we've initiated a number of different training programs to try to help the farmers uh, to learn how to adopt these uh, food safety practices on the farms, help them to prepare for audits, uh, to work with them on more of a, almost like a friendly audit basis to help them walk through what's going to happen and, and try to help to teach them how to make improvements before the actual audit would, uh, would come. It has become really difficult from year to year for me to keep up with the increase in requirements from year to year. Every year there's some new aspect, uh, depending on the scheme that the audit would follow. It's, it's really difficult to, uh, even from an extension agent standpoint, to keep up with that. But um, sort of one of the themes earlier in the, in the day was to be ready for change. And I feel like from an extension standpoint, that definitely has been the case and the food safety program is one of those. And I can remember, when we first started these training programs, it was a group of watermelon growers and there's a lot of watermelons that are produced in this area. And they were one of the first segments of the industry that was going to have to uh, adopt this because almost all watermelons would be shipped. So it was it was clearly a, a good target group for us to work with. And I can remember doing those trainings and having the farmers sit in the back of the room and say, Bob, th th there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. I, I, that's crazy. I'm not going to be able to do that. And, but as time went on, you would get a call back and, and uh, have a reminder from a farmer that said, you know, I remember the time you told me that we were going to have to turn a truck away if there was, like, say, uh, poultry that had been hauled in that truck before. The truck would have to be sent off and sanitized before they'd be able to come back and do it. So early on, we had a lot of uh, opportunities to get communication from farmers sort of thanking us and, and telling stories about things that they thought there's no way that they were gonna be able to uh, accommodate and now have become pretty routine on these, uh, on these farms. But uh, I would say that from a career standpoint, it's almost like that whole industry has emerged in the last 10 years. Uh, so food safety, uh, either, either helping farmers uh, being hired within a farm operation to run a food safety program or becoming a food safety auditor or an inspector, all of that has really emerged and there's great opportunities there, continuing needs uh, in, in that particular area of food safety. So those would be my comments on that sec section of this question. And if I could add on to what Bob was saying relative to food safety just a little bit, uh, one thing to keep in mind with respect to challenges is that we have new challenges from a food safety standpoint we are facing. And the one I'm going to throw out involves cyclospora. Cyclospora has been a problem that's been around for a long, long time, but it is making much more in the way of a resurgence, much more in the way of, of, of exposing and expressing itself. For decades, it's been a problem that had come out of the Latin America area but more and more, we're seeing it here. It's, it's a parasite, so it's different from the bacteria that we're typically dealing with, and it's a fairly large parasite at that, but it comes from a human feces contamination problem, ultimately. So there again, we have to do much more in the way of, of um, sanitation aspects, much more in the way of hyge hygienic aspects, and also we're gonna have to be careful with the septic systems. Because if septic systems flow into other water bodies and that kind of thing, those cyclospora parasites go right with that overflow. And FDA has found cyclospora in a couple of canals in Florida. It hasn't been validated, but initial tests have shown cyclospora presence in Florida. So we're trying to see what, what is the real situation with that. But no, with your, your activities going forward in Florida, cyclospora is going to have to be one you got to think about. I can just add one thing in uh, those comments triggered a, uh, something that I uh, want to want to make a comment on earlier. There was a little bit of a discussion and from a sustainability standpoint, maybe an integrated livestock and vegetable operation, let's say, makes perfect sense from a sustainability standpoint, doesn't it? We're looking at the whole farm. We've got integrated resources. We can make all that work. But when you put it in the context of a food safety lens, it is not the same. Uh, the livestock components within a farming operation be make the food safety aspect very complicated. So when you rotate land, you have to have waiting periods between uh, where livestock have been. Uh, if you have livestock across the fence from where a field of watermelons or lettuce or whatever it might be, is, uh, it ma makes, makes the, from a food safety standpoint, 
very complicated. So uh, if we throw in even organic production, we also further complicate the issue from a food safety standpoint. So in that case where we're actually using composted animal waste or fresh animal waste, there's what there's waiting periods behind that. So um, I always felt like it's a real dichotomy. On the one hand, you get 10 bonus points for those integrated systems and organic production practices, perhaps, but on the food safety system, it might actually create a high risk of an automatic failure for a food safety situation. So, um, so what seems simple on the one hand uh, is, is no longer simple, especially with food safety. In most cases, a farm that has livestock across the fence is going to get a deduction, even if it's being properly managed. If it's in the vicinity of the fruit, fresh fruit and vegetable operation, it's not going to be an automatic failure, but it's, there's going to be an automatic deduction just because of the risk that is posed by the presence of, uh, of livestock within that farm operation. So, yeah, Bob, exa Bob's exactly right with that horse manure example I threw out there. Buyers told our growers that they would not purchase product if their product was grown within two miles of that facility. And with, with cows, it would be even worse. Here, I think I've seen you unmute a couple of times, so I, I know you'd like to chime in as well. So go ahead and uh, share your uh, perspective for this particular question. Thanks. I just think it's worth considering the connection between the first question about sustainability and, and these, these concepts of food security and food safety. Because when we're talking about sustain, sustainability, we're usually talking about um, farm level activity. So the, the, the onus of sustainability is usually on the, discussed on the level of the individual farm. But when we move on to these, the question of security and safety, it's we're kind of acknowledging that that, that success of that individual farm is within the context of what's going on regionally. I think of you know custom and border protection. I think of FDACs, AFIS, the CAPS. These are these organizations and the people who work for them are in a sense like the the immune system for the state for the for the in our in this case the state of Florida keeping making all these efforts for for the overall region addressing invasives and all of these other and pathogens and issues so that the individual farmers or groups of farmers can can then do what they can to be successful or sustainable, if you will. On the individual level, um, yeah. So I just I just think it's worth considering, you know, the way th those 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 various concepts as it has as they relate to each other. There's a one one other thing I wanted to bring up before we we jump out of this question, and that is, and this is a behemoth. So uh, in the interest of time, we're really not going to be able to tackle this the way it should be. But considering the number of students we have on today. One of the greatest threats right now to the movement of diseases and, um, and uh, viroids and viruses is the seed industry. I would recommend um, there's plenty of resources out there to see how seeds come to a farmer, where they go. They can touch 20 different countries on four or five different continents before the seeds have finally made their way back into uh, our market and in the ground. And with what we're seeing now with, and, and the technology we have to find these viroids and viruses and seed borne issues, from the ground level, we're putting in, in, in many cases, infected seeds. The tomato brown rugose fruit virus, that's something that's, uh, you know, right now a problem for our tomato growers and, and peppers that moves around on seed. It was moved around in the seed industry. And the problem with this now is these seeds move so quickly. You could take something that back years ago, an, in, an infestation or an infection rate uh, in a small area, it would take somebody moving product out of that area. It would take a lot or just the natural progression of that pest or disease to, to move that. Now you can literally spread seed borne diseases in a matter of weeks and months everywhere globally. And again, this is a huge concept. Um, every country's got its own phytosanitary measures, every country or they have none. And so this is a, a giant industry that is absolutely critical that we wrap our arms around how do we 
regulate this and make sure the seed that our growers are getting is clean and they're not starting off with a product that's already infected. So I just wanted to throw that out there um, as, as a really important issue, um, but it is a tangled mess right now. Let's see, thank you uh, for all of those really important points. Um, and there's been a really engaging dialogue also happening in the chat. So I, I appreciate that this is kind of pulling up some um, interesting ideas and concepts amongst the participants as well. Um, and I think the next question that Tim will have will kind of address the uh, elephant in the room, so to speak, that we've all been dealing with for um, now over a year, uh, or just about. Right. So yeah, with that said, how do you think COVID-19 has exposed kind of structural weaknesses in the resiliency of our domestic food production system? And, and what changes would you make to bolster that resistance? God forbid there is a, a future COVID in the works. Thoughts on that? I wanted to um, actually ask Mike a question directly related to this uh, as he was wrapping up, but I think I don't it, I don't think it's necessarily exposed weaknesses in in the production. It has more to do with the marketing. When marketing when the markets closed down, a number of people had to switch gears and do things that had never been done before to try to get food to people and also to keep growers from hemorrhaging financially as little as possible. And Mike said that he spent a couple months, four months doing things completely unrelated to his original job description. And I know Gene McAvoy in the Southern part of the state was also in the middle of all this. So I, I, I think related to this, I wanted to ask Mike, had, were lessons learned from COVID in terms of making any institutional changes so that rather than depending on the entrepreneurial skills and the innovative skills of, of people who suddenly had to come up with an entirely new way of finding markets for growers. Have, have lessons been more, has any of this been, are there gonna be any permanent changes so that it, if we do need to do this in the future, we can pivot more, more efficiently? Hugh, that whole thing is still proliferating. Yeah, th this past year fully defined the fact that the supply chain is, is very fragile. I mean, if one thing goes wrong, the whole thing goes off kilter. And yeah, you're absolutely right. From the grower standpoint, the growing the product wasn't the problem. It was the supply chain that was the problem. There are changes that are being proposed, whether they're, you know, whether or not they're going to be fully instituted. That's a good question. There's really not been anything I've seen yet relative to uh, true solutions, I guess you could say, that I've witnessed anyway. There's, there's been more in the way of, of potentially, you know, getting arrangements in place with retail but that's just a small component of it. It's got to be much more than that. So no, I think there needs to be a lot more occur with respect to fixing that supply chain and coming up with those alternative uh, market access points or whatever. Thanks, Mike. I have a couple of comments maybe on the local level here um, that when all this activity was going on in South Florida, uh, those of us in North Florida were in the in the beginning or the middle of the planning season and they saw the tragic situation happening down there and they're wondering what the heck do we do now I mean because they've already invested in getting the crop established and how do they decide to maintain or not maintain that crop do they continue to manage insects and diseases and irrigate and fertilize uh, the, the crop that was at the beginning of our season up here looked like it was going to be a tragic loss as well. And by the time that it got to our harvest season, uh, not that the, the market channels had been fixed by any means by that point, but they had been put together sufficiently so that some of the crops up here uh, were they, they saw some of the best prices that they've ever had in certain commodities, not all commodities. Um, so it was, it, 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 it's really just, there was so much unknown about how those farmers would, uh, would, would or should proceed with the crop that they already had in the ground. 
And I think the summation was, well, we're not going to be able to sell it if we don't have it. And so that was the only choice that they, that they had really was to try to continue to maintain it, be a little bit conservative perhaps, but nonetheless to move ahead. The other piece that was that showed a lot of vulnerability in our system, this is more at the farm level, is uh, access to labor. And so uh, a lot of the fresh fruits and vegetables depend somewhat on local labor, but for the most part depend on migrant labor. And as that migrant labor moves from South Florida to North Florida, for instance, up into Georgia, and maybe continues on up into Indiana or whatever, um, that, that population was, uh, from a COVID standpoint, had very high percentage of positive tests, 75, 85, 90% positive tests, but they were still able because they were essential employees to continue to work unless they really didn't feel well enough to work, which seemed a little odd to me when that first uh, happened. Um, on the one hand, it was a good thing that at least the, the farm would be able to continue to, uh, to go through the processes that it needed to to get the products harvested. But it just seemed unusual to me <laughs> that, that you, have, uh, you, know, you have that situation. Uh, a lot of the labor force is only in an area for a relatively short period of time for some of these crops. So by the time that we were tracking down and working with the farmers and, and gaining access to the, uh, to the migrant labor to make sure that, that they, they had the information that they needed to try to minimize this, then they're, they're gone from here and moving on up into another area. So it was hard to track and keep up with them. And certainly, I, I think even from our extension system standpoint, uh, we, we needed to find newer, faster ways to reach out to the farmers. So, you know, no longer postal mailings, for instance, you know, we have to develop uh, text groups and other social media kinds of methods to be able to access our growers in a more timely, uh, more timely fashion. So I think the other weakness we haven't talked a lot about is uh, the, or, or the challenge is the, is, the, is the whole migrant labor issue. And of course, that's a much more complicated issue than just COVID, but, um, but that, was, uh, that was a very important uh, aspect. We had very, very little positive testing in this area until um, we, we got into the sort of the harvesting season. I'm talking, not, talking about now within our uh, fresh fruit and vegetable farmer uh, citizenry. And, and however, that's where a lot of those farmers became uh, infected as well. So anyway, just, a, just another vulnerability within the system, I think, especially for fresh fruits and vegetables. The last comment on that is it, it's forcing the farms to look at other ways of mechanizing, trying to figure out how they can reduce, uh, reduce labor in any way that they possibly can uh, on the farms. And as was uh, mentioned earlier, mechanical harvesting of strawberries and things like that, just any way that any way that the farms can mechanize, they're really having to consider to, to go to that, uh, to go to that level. Other comments? I don't, I don't know that I have anything insightful uh, that everybody doesn't really know as far as, uh, you know, the issues with, with COVID-19, but I, I do want to kind of hit on the fact that as Mike presented earlier, the amount of produce, the amount of plant material moving around during this time increased. So yes, we were all considered essential. So we were out working in the field, but that didn't, you know, there's all these other issues and all these other things that were affected. So, um, you know, one of the greatest weaknesses I saw in all this was that we had the same workforce, we had the same number of inspectors, we had the same number of people, yet we had a doubling in some cases in certain industries that we regulate of product moving that we had to deal with. So, um, I don't have an answer to that because this is such a unique scenario. Um, I mean, obviously uh, we could, there will be other pandemics of greater or lesser extent, but that's something we need to deal with internally and then not taking any shots at the USDA, but they were able to self-report. So they just didn't work. I mean, they would have to telework or they would 
they would not actually be out in the field. So our federal partners weren't out there. So they were doing their best. It's, it's, they were doing the best they could, but we didn't have our partners either. So now we've got a doubling of some sectors that we're re responsible for, and we don't have our federal partners at full staff. And it just, um, trying to do right by our growers and make sure we were able to, to, to safeguard, but at the same time allow the movement of material was a incredible challenge and um, something that we need to consider in the future. Yeah, I have no additional comment uh, for this topic. I thought uh, Michael and Bob and Hugh and the other uh, panel members uh, did a great job at uh, addressing uh, this question. So thank you very much. I could tell a little side story here, just a little fun story, perhaps, about this COVID thing from an extension agent perspective. You know, when from a university standpoint, we're, we were not able to conduct business like we normally would, and that would be to come to work, get in the vehicle, and go out to from farm to farm and visit farmers and help them try to figure out what's going on on the farm. We had to go through a portal to be able to get permission to travel, and uh, we had to maintain certain you know, re requirements, which certainly made sense when we got to the farm. But I would say that uh, as an essential employee at a research center, trying to keep things alive and so forth, I don't think I've worked as hard as I have since I was maybe 16 years old growing up on a farm pitching watermelons. It was a, it was a really hard physical year being uh, in an essential employees uh, kind of a system. And we had a lot of research projects that were already established and say like Amanda couldn't get to her project. So we didn't want Amanda's project to fail. So we, we tried to do everything that we could at least to limp along and keep the projects going. However, the story is that uh, I frequently would visit watermelon farms and, uh, and this one farm in particular I would go and we would meet in this uh, particular uh, yard area and jump in his pickup truck and go out and uh, he would show me the fields that uh, that he wanted me to look at. He would not allow us, even previous to COVID, to drive my own university vehicle into his fields. He had a super biosecurity concern about where I've been. I've been from another farm. Am I going to bring downy mildew into his farm, so forth and so on? which was a very fair thing. So over the last many, many years, that's been our system. I go down, meet, get in his truck, do what I have to do and collect the samples or whatever, and then go back and off we go. Well, I couldn't ride in his truck. He wouldn't allow us to use this vehicle, my own vehicle, the university vehicle to go onto the farms. So the solution was that he had uh, two very nice four wheelers that he would wipe down sanitize and say, there they are, Bob, Here, here's field one, two, four, and seven, and have at it. So it was <laughs> it was a really fun experience to get on a four-wheeler and go out and do business. But just to, that was the only way with the restrictions that he had, the restrictions that I had, and the restrictions that COVID put on us, we still wanted to accomplish the, ultimately the goal that he needed. And so just a little, just a little fun, innovative story of uh, trying to make things work. Yeah, I would definitely say that that's a, a great example of resilience in light of an unpredictable um, health crisis or pandemic that we're experiencing right now. Um, Hugh, were you also uh, going to chime in there? I saw the unmuted, if not. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to ask a question for you know, James Mack about did, did this, was um, Customs and Border Protection, was that impacted by was it its ability to fulfill its basic functions impacted by, you know, illness or, or some of these restrictions, the way some of the rest of us had to, were either not allowed to work for a certain amount of time or had to find a way around uh, restrictions to do what we needed to do? Was that also the, 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 the same question in your organization? Uh, that's a definite yes. Um, as, as many other agencies, uh, private sector and so forth. Uh, CBP uh, employees have been impacted uh, with the COVID-19 diseases. And so what this has um, done to the ports of entry is that it has um, slowed to some extent. Uh, initially, uh, the cargo or uh, import clearances and, and at least meeting the demands of, of the cargo industry. 
Um, as, as many of you are aware, the air side, the airline, that industry slowed quite a bit. So CBP has had to move their resources from the airline or the air side environment into the cargo operations. Um, to, complete, to also go along with that, um, we, CBP had not seen a major slowdown in the commercial cargo imports. So we had to uh, continue to staff uh, that environment, both along the southern, northern land border uh, operations, as well as many of the airports and seaports. So to answer your question, yes, uh, we were somewhat impacted. We, we lost on an average of, um, I would say the last count I know of, 25 of our officers and ag specialists um, did uh, succumb to the COVID-19 uh, disease. Um, so we are building and gradually um, trying to get back to some sense of normalcy. Most of our uh, office employees are still teleworking. Um, like myself as a liaison, I have been teleworking for the past year. Um, the frontline employees, uh, they um, have to more be available, but we have used several strategies uh, to mitigate um, the risk of them getting sick and, and so forth. So yes, we have been impacted like most of the other um, industries and agencies. Thank you. Thank you. So in the interest of time, I think we should proceed to the next question. Absolutely. And um, that particular question and everything that we've come up uh, in discussion so far, there's not really a end solution to the question of like, how do we um, increase the, the food safety and security of our fruit and vegetables in Florida, or how do we try and work around things like COVID-19. But um, since this is the plant doctor plant health conference, uh, what would you say is the role that plant doctors have in addressing problems that often defy these one size fit all solutions? I'll take a stab at that one. Since we uh, snap up DPM graduates uh, on a regular basis here at uh, DPI, um, I think one of the things we're losing out there is field scientists. Um, we've got so many specialists now and everybody specializing in, um, in, in the these very, very, very focused areas. And we need that now. Um, you know, a lot of the technology that we're using now, um, that's needed. But I do believe we're losing those field scientists that, that were produced in decades past where I want scientists in the field that can recognize, know something about nematodes, know something about plant pathogens, know something about entomology, know something about horticulture and growing plants. And it's a nice niche that DPM has, has fit into um, for that need for us. And it, it's a lot to pile on, uh, you know, a, a single kind of degree, but it's also interactive. So it's, sure. it's part extension, it's part scientist, it's part um, just community, um, somebody that understands uh, what's going on out there. And, um, I, we, we need a lot of that. We, we need it. I know uh, the universities need extensions. Extension uh, folks need those kind of well-rounded uh, scientists. So um, I think that's a, a, there's a shortage there. And I think uh, uh, DPM is a, a great place to, to fill that. I would definitely echo that from an extension standpoint, especially county, regional, faculty level. Uh, I almost everything that was just said it applies to extension as well. That uh, having having somebody that has a well versed uh, set of experience, even though they may be specialized in a particular area, plant pathogens or insects or whatever, I think uh, having somebody at the field to at least recognize that hmm, this probably is not a disease issue. It may be something that's an insect vectored problem or whatever. Uh, so we're 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 um, creating a more and more of a gap, I think, 
uh, and that's where the DPM students uh, really have an opportunity to shine at those uh, at those kind of regional and county faculty uh, levels. Uh, years and years ago, many of us, I'll include myself in that old generation, you know, likely came off of farms or, you know, had had more practical experience and and probably were, were not nearly as well trained at the time as students come today. But um, but I think we've lost more and more uh, the connection with that practical farm experience, perhaps. And so the technical training that folks get coming out of college now is probably higher than it was before. But the unique thing that the DPM students have is that broad range of, um, of experiences across many different departments. And I think Dr. Turner has a has a note in the in the chat box there where, you know, we just have so many different uh, departments that you can connect with and gain experiences. We've talked a lot about food safety and, and there's a whole separate department there that maybe I would have never even <laughs> thought that I would have a connection with. And all of a sudden, 10 years ago, eight years ago, six years ago, that's one of the main departments in working with the food safety researchers and, and uh, extension specialists. So anyway, I, I just sort of echo what Tim was saying. It's just, it's, it's a very unique role. That, that gap, I believe, is widening. And so there's more and more opportunities there for uh, someone that comes out of school with a wide range of experiences like the DPM students do. I, um, I would say that um, plant doctors have a central role just by the nature of what the program is and the sort of person who, who wants to become a, a, a DPM. Um, I mean, you're, you're generalists, but what you do all specialize in is solving problems, whatever the problem is. I, I'm an entomologist and I, in the 10 years I've been here back, back in Florida, you know, some pretty serious, significant things have happened. And I mean, something a DPM graduate is never gonna say is, oh, I don't work on that. That's my opinion is we are all paid to engage in the, collect, the collective detective work of, of, of solving growers problems. And I think that is very much the spirit and the nature of the DPM program and the people who, who come through the program. So by being generalists and by saying, okay, whatever the problem is, we're here to, to figure out how to address it. Um, that's what I think you guys are all about. And I, that's why I would say you have, you have a, a central role in addressing in addressing these problems. Well, hopefully I got the idea across. Just be flexible, be willing to work outside what might be your routine comfort zone because the future opportunities are there. Ditto on that one loud and clear from my, from my perspective, wow. Are there any other final comments about this particular question in the role of uh, plant doctors? Uh, no, no question from you, Ned, but uh, I definitely like to share that CBP um, is hiring. And so individuals who may be graduating soon and are interested in joining our organization, uh, the next announcements uh, will be coming out on USA Jobs, and that will be uh, March 15th of this year. So again, thank you guys for, for the knowledge um, that you do. I vaguely do um, know about the program. I have looked into it myself and I've spoken to Dr. Hodges about joining the program. But um, just like you, you guys would be a great compliment to the CBP uh, organization as well as the USDA. So, um, and we, we, as a matter of fact, we have hired quite a bit of uh, doctors of plant medicine students um, doing an awesome job within our organizations at the Port of Entry. So um, kudos to you guys, keep up the good work and definitely we will welcome you anytime. Thank you. Hold on, you net. Extensions hiring too. We got. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> <laughs> got to get a little arm wrestling over here out, out, over good students coming out of there. But uh, I think the point B is 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 loud and clear that there's a lot of opportunities for folks. And um, I, I think a couple of times here, I just want to circle back. Communication skills is is becoming you know uh, almost like a lost art in some cases have really good scientists but learning how to communicate with our clientele anytime that you can take courses and trying to help help yourself learn uh, ways to communicate uh, 
face-to-face -face communication in particular uh, is well worth it. Excellent, thank you. I definitely think that the, the DPM program allows its students, um, and as an alumna myself, we, we have the opportunity to communicate with diverse stakeholders involved in the plant health sciences and the plant health industry, uh, as is evidenced by the attendees of this conference today, um, that we're definitely representing every aspect of, of this community. Um, so I think we just have our one final question uh, still related to the Dr. Plant Medicine degree program that Tim can kind of segue to. We do, it's a perfect transition. What do you all think about curricular additions or experiences that could be embedded you know, in the DPM experience that would better prepare, you know, plant doctors for the challenges ahead. How can we groom our graduates better for your respective industries, fields of expertise? Well, Tim, I've got one. Um, I found, I wrote this down, I found a course that NC State offers called Regulatory Science in Agriculture. Now, it just seems like that would be a phenomenal type of thing to deal with when you're talking about FIFRA and FQPA and FF. DCA and FISMA, boy, if you even want to know what all those acronyms mean, you're going to need some regulatory background. So I think some sort of a regulatory science course in ag that the program might be able to offer would be phenomenal. Maybe copy what NC State's doing, whatever. Any other thoughts? I don't know. I have run into DPM graduates in different parts of this country doing a lot of different things and they're, they're usually pretty well prepared. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher and so I, I sometimes think, and I know a lot of the students do get research experience and I've, I guess I feel that some research experience consistently in the program would be useful if only to expose students to an understanding of statistics and all of the things that it can't tell you, just to be even a little bit more skeptical of, you know, uh, uh, of statistics. But this is just a, that's kind of a minor, a minor thing. And I know most students, most DPM students, do get some exposure to uh, varying degrees of research, but they are usually very well prepared, regardless of what they're doing. Where I've where I've encountered them. Yeah, I I agree with that. that I, I don't know that I've ever seen a program where you could ask a group of students, me included when I was a, a graduate student, who's the, do you know what a spud is? Do you know who the spro is? Do you know what PPQ does? Do you know that? And then you can move right into all the biology um, and, and the agricultural components. I think it's a very, very well-rounded group. Um, and I know you all have are, are scheduled for speaking engagements all of the time. So I think on the communication front, um, it's just a, it's a really well-rounded program. I'll throw something out, just something I, I and I say this to uh, most graduate students when asked, I think leadership programs are incredibly important. You, you are all leaders. You're going to be leaders. Even if you're just, even if you don't have, 300 people working for you, you are a leader. And there is, I cannot believe the amount of the, the benefit that I got from going through leadership programs offered right there at UF. I mean, UF is at the very top tier when it comes to leadership programs. If, if you had the cherry on top, I would say maybe building in some of that leadership training and, um, and some of the programs that are offered at, at UF uh, that just, it just makes you a more well-rounded person because you're always going to be a leader at some point. Sometimes you're a follower, sometimes you're a leader, uh, but it's really, like I said, the benefits of going through some of that, some of the things that seem obvious when you're in that training, like, how did I not see that I was doing this this way? This was just, just yeah, it, it takes somebody pointing it out, but that's just me throwing out, uh, again, the cherry on top. 
Yeah, one thought that um, comes to mind um, is the opportunity to work um, with outreach. Um, as an example, um, I'm going to put my Don Pack a Pest uh, program uh, that I work collaboratively with uh, USDA as well as uh, FDAX. And um, via that program, um, we have been working with universities such as the Oregon State University students, uh, the Texas A&M students, um, and they have been able to focus the Don't Pack a Pest program to study abroad students, um, which, is, which is, I mean, it's just been a phenomenal, phenomenal um, spread of, of the outreach program uh, throughout these states and beyond. So I don't know how much um, opportunity the program allows or provides for outreaches, but that is something that has come to mind. And even, um, I mean, even at the Florida Agriculture Affairs, uh, I, you probably, uh, some of the students probably already participate in those, but even that is beneficial because as you move into the various uh, agencies, whether federal, state, local, um, outreach is, is one of the good ways of um, getting information out to individuals in, in terms of helping us secure and safeguard our agriculture and natural resources. Thank you. Looks like Madeline had a question. Yes, I have a couple of ideas. Um, one is that for those students, those graduates who want to be field oriented, it would be very helpful to finish the CTA certification program before you come out of the program. That will allow you to uh, qualify for early entry within the regulations of WPS. That's very, very important if you're doing field work. It doesn't apply to university people. So for those of you who want to go into the extension service, for example, it doesn't apply. But for those who want to go into the private sector, it would be very helpful. Um, the second is that since the DPM program is based on problem solving. That involves critical thinking. And it would be helpful to have a formal critical thinking class. Um, we used to have those at University of Florida, and I'm not aware of them at this point. Dr. Turner, maybe you can correct me on that. But I think uh, whatever amount of that curriculum we might be able to squeeze in would be really useful and it would follow right along with our goal of teaching, teaching problem solving. Um, and I have to say that, uh, Trevor, I really agree with your idea about leadership training. I think that's really important. So thank you. Anyone else, any other comments? We'll just put a couple couple comments. Uh, I think that the uh, the program does a really good job of uh, doing the preparation over a wide number of things. So it seems kind of odd to add, add things on uh, to mm -hmm. something that's already uh, got a pretty broad reach. But um, I, I I would say that I still would circle back on the on the communications piece uh, and maybe add in a little bit on sort of the writing skills, practical writing skills, uh, not technical writing skills necessarily, because most folks are maybe not going to end up in a, in a research type field, but trying to uh, write at a level that uh, we can communicate at, a, at more of a practical level. And then the other one that there may already be some things that are done. I'm not hundred percent familiar with all of the curriculum, but uh, sort of this notion of uh, the complexity of agricultural issues, modern ag issues. There's some of that's wrapped up in the regulatory aspect that Mike had mentioned, um, but but you know just the environmental issues, especially here in the state of Florida, are, are becoming really really dominant. And um, so I, I would just throw out that sort of area. Uh, and, and I think it would be not just one department, you know, whether it's food safety or water quality or pest management uh, aspects, there's a lot of things there that uh, seem like that create situations and opportunities to learn about some of these really wicked complex ag related issues. Excellent point. 
Uh, just quick thoughts from, from me. Uh, in terms of all of these options that have been proposed, I suppose my only apprehension would be that as we make the program, if we were to make the program more prescriptive in terms of options, that diminishes some of that flexibility that has historically been built in to the program. And, and Amanda, you could probably speak best to this. I know the program was reduced from 120 to 90 credits. So would you like to weigh in on that briefly, not to put you in on the, you know, on the spot? Sure, I can comment on that. Well, the, the credit reduction really related to the hours that uh, students were paying for internships rather than a reduction in any sort of requirement or quality. Historically, uh, students may have, uh, you know, had a nine credit, you know, internship that, for example, was in California and actually had very little faculty involvement. And so where we, where we cut the credits, not actually was in the substance of the program, but in what students were paying for in terms of the cost. And we also increased the uh, requirements for what students are required to report regarding to their internships. There were some faculty concerns about um, internship quality. And so now we require a proposal and a summary following the internship to make sure that it's a quality uh, experience. So what a uh, three credit internship that's considered a substantial internship, for example, is the equivalent of an entire semester. That's about 15 weeks at 40 hours per week. And so that's a, that's a that, but we feel like, felt like that was sufficient because we really didn't need to charge you know, nine credits for, for an external experience like that. There is flexibility, more flexibility in the curriculum now than there has been in the past, but there still are core requirements by the disciplines, particularly because the written competency exams must be passed by the students. And so it's important for students to complete certain core courses within those competency areas in order to pass. So uh, you know, I think uh, probably more of these options could just be uh, included in, uh, you know, in the in a revised uh, look at the curriculum. But but I do think uh, right now we, we, we're receiving really positive feedback about the graduates that are being produced, and uh, the graduates currently are in extremely high demand for employment. So are we, is, is that the, the last question, Tim? That is the last question. I was going to ask if there are any closing comments, questions before we segue to the scholarship portion of the program. Okay, hearing none, I want to thank all the panelists and all the participants today in the audience. I think it's been a very illuminating experience. This, this format has worked pretty darn well. I've been very pleased and I hope you all have gotten something tangible out of it, certainly. So with that, uh, Amanda, did you want to take a five minute break or did you want to segue directly into the scholarship? I think we're going to segue into the scholarship, but before we do that, Tim, I would like uh, Brianna Whitman to just briefly tell us a little bit about uh, what the students are doing virtually for, for February Flora and Fauna Fest this year. Great. And Brianna, are you ready to just uh, briefly uh, update everyone on the virtual educational pieces we have for February 4th? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we just um, created some uh, quick little videos. So the student organization put together um, a collection um, of videos, mainly for the general public. Um, we, we are quite a variety because I let everyone pick what they wanted. Um, so we have um, some more plant related stuff. So someone did um, a video on like fresh cut flower maintenance, which I thought was really great. Um, we have some insect stuff um, where we have some identifications um, of different insects and we have um, plant pathology um, where we have like a plant ID and also like um, sample submissions, like how to do that. Um, so that is all posted um, and we can send out the link to you guys again. Um, but, you know, hopefully it makes up for not having an, an in-person event like we wanted.
Yes, so we'll be sending that out. I also wanted to remind everyone that, uh, of course, we started the February Flora and Fauna Fest event and this uh, plant doctors and plant health professionals conference for a couple of uh, purposes. I mean, the February Flora and Fauna Fest event, we're hoping to, in the long term, really excite the community in Gainesville, Florida, about this awesome, uh, uh, unusual uh, interdisciplinary doctorate program that started right here in Gainesville, Florida. And so we, we hope to have that as a live event. Hopefully we'll be able to return to a live event with February Flora and Fauna Fest next year. And, and of course the plant doctors and plant health professionals conference, we hope to keep going with that as well. And while we have both these events, we're hoping to continue to raise additional funds for the George uh, Agrios uh, scholarship endowment. And which is really an important like first step for the program to have a first official scholarship endowment in honor of our first director, the late Dr. George Agrios. And with that, Tim, if you're ready, I think we can go right into the awards. Took me a while to unmute there. Uh, Amanda, did you want to give a, a brief spiel about some of the, the benefactors that made this possible, you'd be better equipped than I would be. Sure, I'd, I'd really like to, to thank, I would say the, the key donors initially were the Martin Law Firm. That was very important for, for the initial uh, donation. And then the other major donor uh, was uh, the Agrios family of themselves. They were, they significantly contributed to the award last year when they were able to join us uh, for um, for the banquet, the, the barbecue banquet that we had in February of 2020. And uh, we were also very thankful last in 2020, Agra Marilla provided the funds for, for last year's scholarship. And we've had several other um, alumni and, uh, and faculty donate to this particular scholarship to, to allow us to reach this level of, of $30,000 to at least have an endowed scholarship. And we do need to keep uh, hopefully raising funds for that scholarship so we can grow the, the scholarship. Uh, and in the long term, we can offer more scholarships or perhaps matches for graduate research assistantships and positions for graduate students based on the funds that we may raise. And so we'll be continuing to highlight the excellent contributions of all of our, our donors in the coming uh, month. And we'd also like to acknowledge those donors that really participated in the conference last year, which included uh, FMC, Landback Agriculture, Syngenta, and, and I already mentioned Agrimarilla. So with that, Tim? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Amanda. So I basically put together an ad hoc committee of, turned out to be 11 DPM alums that uh, evaluated the scholarship applications and we had uh, five or six if memory serves and the final tally was pretty close it was <laughs> close quarters numerically for sure but with that said there was definitely a standout and that standout was Hannah Talton so let me just read you all a little bit of a biography uh, on Hannah and you could hopefully my screen share is still working. Their little collage that I put together as well of Hannah in kind of various uh, compartments. So the outreach compartment uh, in the upper right, the bottom right, I believe that was a picture of her at Manners, which basically pertains to minorities in agriculture and uh, natural resources. So getting traditionally underserved populations involved in the sciences, a critical need. On the middle, that's Hannah uh, basically stumping for the DPM program at a, a national conference. And on the left, of course, her doing some, some field work. So she clearly has a, a diversity of experiences and just her overall portfolio was extremely impressive. So we, we definitely feel that she was a worthy recipient of the $1,000 uh, Agrios scholarship, the second uh, scholarship awarded. So really quick, of Hannah, she was born and raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. So not altogether that far from where I am right now at, at Ferrum College in Virginia. 
She graduated with honors in May 2017, uh, receiving a bachelor's degree in natural resources and environmental design with a concentration in urban and community horticulture from North Carolina A&T University. In the fall of 2017, she decided to make the move to Gainesville, Florida to pursue a master's degree in entomology. And under the superv supervision of Dr. Oscar Liburd, she joined the, uh, the Small Fruit and Vegetable IPM Laboratory at the University of Florida's uh, Entomology and Nematology Department. Her research uh, basically entailed an assessment of the phenology and susceptibility of three different strawberry cultivars when exposed to a seed bug pest, Neopamera biblobata, if I'm pronouncing that right, probably mangling it. I had to look it up. I wasn't aware of the, the family offhand, and I, I don't recall it <laughs> for the time being, but it was not, not a, a taxon that I had any familiarity with at all. Uh, upon graduation with her master's, she joined the DPM program. So it was an intuitive uh, next step for her. And, and it was a great platform, that master's degree, certainly. So currently she's working on a collaborative survey and trapping project for the old world bullworm. She's also active in the upkeep of the DPM newsletter. Uh, also, in addition, working on an integrated organic carrot project with her uh, committee co-chair in Live Oak, Florida. So she is literally all over creation, <laughs> doing many different things concurrently. Uh, throughout her master's and doctoral journey, she's devoted her time to community service, mentorship, and professional development through involvement in various student organizations, including manners, minorities in ag, natural resources, and related sciences, uh, the Black Graduate Student Organization, DPM Student Organization. She also serves as the DPM Student Liaison for the department's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. So Hannah has clearly positioned herself as an advocate for getting those underserved individuals involved in the sciences. That's mission critical. And if she has any spare time left, uh, she enjoys playing sports, watching movies, listening to music, cooking, and hanging out with friends. So with, with that said, I would like to virtually confer <laughs> The, the scholarship upon Hannah as best I can in this setting. It was much, very well deserved. Again, congratulations, Hannah. Thank you so, so, so much. Thanks everyone for the congratulations. I appreciate it. Um, I'm truly honored to be the second recipient of this scholarship. And fun fact, it took me about three years to get into the DPM program. Um, I was, it was a long-term recruitment uh, awareness project um, being in communication with Dr. Hodges. Um, we first met at a, um, a multicultural scholars uh, I would say, would you say director's meeting? Um, and she was coming in from the, the National Needs Fellow side and trying to get scholarships for the DPM program um, from the graduate side. So I was a multi USDA multicultural scholar and I met Dr. Hodges and she gave me her card and the rest was history. I kept trying to get in touch with her and saying like, this is the program I wanna be in because it mirrored my undergrad degree so perfectly on how I was just doing different rotations um, in different areas within in horticulture. So from the greenhouse production side to the season extension and high tunnel, low tunnel side um, to the outreach side. So I definitely pride myself in trying to get students who look like me, women um, and other minorities into the agricultural sciences as a whole. Um, so I'm big on outreach. I love that aspect about manners. And I've been in it about six years from undergrad into graduate. I'm glad UF has a chapter. It's one of the greatest ways to bridge that gap um, within 1890s and the 1862 institutions, land grant institutions. So I had a blast um, doing a plant to seed activity at the last Flora and Fauna Fest um, for young kids just to get active in, in pollination and what it means to actually have a plant at home and taking care of it. 
um, on top of research. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. I, I just enjoy being active. And if I'm not doing something, uh, I feel like I'm just stagnant. So I end up trying to, to kind of, like you said, align myself and, and market myself in such a way in which I'm actually um, getting students more interested in ag as well as, you know, figuring out what I would like to do within my profession. So this program has helped me so much in just diversifying my, my mindset. I came from horticulture, so plants, growing plants, but I didn't know what was attacking my plants and, and eating my plants and, you know, diseases um, that was affecting my plants. So I wanted to know more. So that curiosity kind of kept me going um, throughout the whole, throughout my whole education. So I am grateful, uh, truly, I've been funding my way through college uh, and all my different tenures. So this has been helpful so much in, in just knowing that I'm doing what I can, I'm doing the best I can and thank you for your recognition. I truly appreciate it. Um, and I, I'm grateful for the program and everyone in it and everyone on this call today. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think it's pretty evident that you're just a multifaceted marble. I mean, really, <laughs> the, the complete package, and you were very deserving. It was pretty obvious. Uh, so, Dr. Hodges or Dr. Turner or Dr. Brenda Mule, did you have any any comments? Would you like to interject? Uh, Dr. Turner, are you I'll just verbally com uh, com congratulate Hannah. Um, really proud of. Her and what a great selection for this scholarship. Uh, she's been a real leader and in Manners and other organizations and Manners has been helping us push the envelope in um, uh, being a more welcoming college, university, departments and being a place that students want to come because we know we have the opportunities for them to thrive. So uh, shout out to Hannah and um, all the great work that she's done, both as a student in outreach and in service. Great choice. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner. And we really appreciate the college's support of the DPM program. And, and Hannah, you know that I'm quite proud of you and, and everything that, that you're doing. You know, it's, it's, you are certainly a well-deserving recipient and, uh, just uh, continue to demonstrate the excellence that you have and you have a certainly a bright career and future ahead of you and we're all very proud of you. And, and with that, uh, Tim, if you have any closing remarks, I think that uh, we are at the point of ending the meeting. Yeah, no closing remarks to speak of. I, I've already sung Hannah's praises, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> We're very proud of you, Hannah, and proud of all of our students and alumni. I really appreciate everyone as joining us here today for a virtual meeting on, on, on a Saturday, and we look forward to your feedback. We hope that we'll be in person again in the future, but you know, as Dr. Turner said, maybe some of these meetings can also occur virtually if we have a, a better reach in the future. And I really appreciated seeing the diverse participation from California to Texas to Illinois and, and, and Maryland to all the way over to Egypt. So uh, congratulations to all of you and thank you so much for joining us today.